Okay, we're back on uh, Ms. Johnson's matter. She's here. We're outside the presence of the jury. We have several matters to discuss. Um, there are uh, two motions that were filed last week by the defense that are pending. We have jury instructions to resolve, uh, and I want to talk about the uh, Rule 20 um, motion regarding the allegation of dangerous crimes against children and how we would proceed in the event that that is still um, going forward. Let me start with the state because two motions were filed, I think it was Thursday of last week. I know this Friday. Friday, Friday. Friday of last week. I know that Ms. Andrews was out of town. Um, I don't know what kind of opportunity you've had to analyze the motions, whether you're prepared to argue them now, if you want to have some more time and talk about them this afternoon. Uh, I wanted to get a sense for where you're at before we start talking about the content of the motion. So, Ms. Andrews? Your Honor, here's the issue. As the court is aware, I was out of town on Friday, and at the particular time they sent the, uh, they forwarded the motions to us, I was unavailable by telephone and email as well. Um, they did, they accidentally failed to include Ms. Ramuno on them. And so I didn't get them until evening, Arizona hours, and sent them to Ms. Ramuno at that point. I did not look, have the chance to look at them until this morning. Ms. Ramuno did some research on one. I've looked into a couple of the other motions. We can certainly talk about them, but I will tell you, um, I guess if the court's inclined, inclined to rule against the state on those issues, we would like more time to have the opportunity to look into the case law. Um, but we are able to talk about it generally, especially as far as the jury instructions go and the Rule 20 motion. We certainly could begin a discussion about it, but I, I can't guarantee the court we're fully ready to respond to everything that might come our way. Well, let's go forward and see where we end up. Um, I am sensitive to the state's um, lack of time in terms of putting together a response or otherwise researching. And if I believe that, um, if I come to the point where I'm going to rule against the state, I almost certainly will give you time to come back and um, cite more cases and make additional argument going forward. But let's get it on the table and see where I end up on those issues. I think I'm going to start with the motions, and then we'll then talk about um, the first Rule 20 that was filed, and then we'll talk about jury instructions, where we stand last. So um, in no particular order, how about the um, motion pursuant to Rule 20 re-kidnapping? And that's got a date of October 12th, which would be Friday. Um, actu actually, you know what? Let's do the, the motion to dismiss count one of the indictment first. That also goes to the kidnapping charge, but I want to do that one first instead of the Rule 20. Um, the motion um, argues that the um, state essentially has failed to present evidence of an element of the kidnapping that occurred in Arizona or um, that there was a result in Arizona sufficient to establish jurisdiction as required by ARS 13-108. Um, uh, and I have um, reviewed the motion. Let me let me turn to the state to see what the state has in response. I mean, the motion tells me, I think, obviously, what the defense um, believes is the appropriate framework for analysis and the appropriate case law. Let me ask the state um, for a response, and let's talk about where we're at on that issue. And, Your Honor, I, I don't have any case law on this particular issue. I didn't have time to research it, but I, I think based on the clear letter of the jurisdiction statute, which I'm now looking for, that says that there's jurisdiction over an offense if conduct constituting any element of the offense or a result of such conduct occurs within the state. Um, Your Honor, for the crime of kidnapping, the elements are we have to show that the defendant knowingly restrained Gabriel Johnson with the intent to place Logan McQuarrie in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury to Gabriel Johnson. I think that the easiest argument that gets us there for jurisdiction is that um, 
the intent was to place Logan McQuarrie in reasonable apprehension. Logan McQuarrie was in Arizona the whole time. I mean, he's clearly in Arizona. There's no evidence otherwise. Um, the evidence is clear that between the dates of the offense, December 18th through December 30th, 2009, Logan McQuarrie, who was the one being placed in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury, or the one that she had to intend to place, was in Arizona at the time. Your Honor, the other... The other element of the crime that we would have to prove that gives us jurisdiction is under the definition for restraint, and the defendant had to knowingly restrain Gabriel Johnson. The evidence is, is that on December 17, 2009, there was a court order ordering joint custody to both Elizabeth Johnson and Logan McQuarrie of Gabriel Johnson. The order was that on December 20, 2009, Logan McQuarrie was to have physical custody of Gabriel Johnson. The evidence is that on December 18, 2009, Elizabeth Johnson left the state with Gabriel Johnson. And our argument is that by doing so, she's restrained Gabriel Johnson because she had not, um, she had not lawfully taken him. The, the victim's lawful custodian had not acquiesced in the movement or confinement. Now, I know the argument from the defense is that on the 18th, Elizabeth Johnson had the right to do that. But from the 20th on, she had no legal right to do that. And in fact, um, because from the 20th, the 20th through the 30th, Logan McQuarrie was the lawful custodian. That is an element of the crime. And because the, the order that made Logan McQuarrie the lawful custodian from the 20th through the 30th was an Arizona order, that gives us jurisdiction. Essentially, on the 20th, Logan was supposed to have physical custody of Gabriel Johnson. On the 21st, he was ordered to have temporary legal custody, meaning he was the only one to have any legal custody as well. And the evidence shows that. So, Your Honor, for those two reasons, we have jurisdiction in the state of Arizona. I will also argue that Elizabeth Johnson's statement to Logan McQuarrie on December 18th, where she called him up before she left the state and said, you will never see Gabriel again, and then she left the state, gives us jurisdiction to the state of Arizona. Okay. And let me make sure that I understand the, the proper framework. If we're talking about 13108, if the state meets any of the five enumerated possibilities under A, then um, the state does have jurisdiction. Do you agree, Mr. Victor? Yes, Judge. Okay. And essentially, um, Ms. Andrews gave me arguments for um, 13108A1, the result occurred in Arizona, and then um, the would be um, A3. I'm sorry, not A3. It would be... Would it be A3? Your Honor, I don't think so. For the kidnapping charge, and that's that's all the argument is regarding, I think A1 okay. applies. Okay, so it's just A1. It's the conduct itself or the result. So an alternative argument under A1. Okay, let me tell you where I think the state's right, and it's the result argument. Um, Logan McQuarrie is located here. Um, I know that you've argued that the state hasn't presented evidence of Mr. McQuarrie's state of mind, so we don't know the result. But I don't think that's what the statute contemplates, that the state has the burden of proving that a, a result actually occurred. It has the burden, I think, of showing that the intended result was in Arizona, and that was Mr. McQuarrie. Um, it's established by Mr. McQuarrie being here. If the jury finds that she had intent, then him being here, I think, establishes the result requirement under 13108A1. Um, I also note that um, we're essentially, your argument would be adding an element to this offense, meaning that they'd have to show that he was actually in placed in fear, and you'd argued that the state couldn't present evidence of his state of mind, and now you're arguing that they haven't, so they haven't met the jurisdictional requirements. Um, while I guess technically that's not 
wrong. Realistically, um, I think, on one hand, me prohibiting them from getting into his intent and then uh, telling them that, well, they needed to show his intent to get to the uh, jurisdictional requirement, that, that would trouble me. I don't even need to get there, though. To me, the result is, the intended result is to place Logan McQuarrie in fear. He's here in Arizona, so the result's in Arizona. To me, that's straightforward and pretty easy. So that's where I'm at. Ms. Clark's going to make the argument on this guy, Ms. Clark. Well, Judge, I mean, I, I understand your argument, and it, it's a valid one, but when looking at the case law interpreting the statute, it clearly says that there needs to be a detrimental effect that was part of the design. It's requiring not only the intent of the defendant, but also the actual result. And while that's not an element of the kidnapping statute, Mr. McQuarrie's state of mind, obviously we've discussed it's not an element of the kidnapping statute. It is still an element of jurisdiction they're required to, re to find uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a separate requirement outside of the kidnapping, um, the kidnapping elements. Because there are certain elements for jurisdiction established by the jurisdictional statute, that's an element that they have to prove regardless of the fact that it's not an element of the actual charge of kidnapping. I just don't see how we get past the fact that the case law clearly indicates that there needs to be an intent or a design of the defendant as well as an actual result in the state of Arizona. I mean, otherwise we're extending jurisdiction to the point maybe somebody's in another state and has the intent to do something in Arizona, but they never actually accomplish it. They never even actually get to Arizona or have any sort of effect on Arizona. At this point, we're extending jurisdiction to extreme amounts for Arizona. Well, uh, the case we're talking about here is not the theoretical case where the person has no contact with Arizona. Um, here, I think, um, I result, I, I re read that second clause of A1 um, a little bit more broadly, and that is the intended result. Um, maybe you can argue I'm reading an additional word into it, but I think realistically that my choice is force the state to prove Logan McQuarrie's state of mind, which I think has got all kinds of 403 issues in this case for the reasons I agreed with your position previously, um, or find that the intent of the statute is that if the aimed result occurs here, then that is sufficient for the statute. And I think the second choice is the better choice. I understand your argument, but to me, the result of the conduct is Mr. McQuarrie being potentially placed or intended to be placed. Again, it's, to me, it's the result of the intended, um, or it's the intended result that we're talking about here. So you're just not getting me there on this one. I, I, I think it's an interesting question whether there's got to be a showing of um, uh, an actual result, uh, but uh, in this case, I don't think that, I don't think the state's got that requirement. Well, Judge, I, like I said already, I'll have to respectfully disagree that I think that there does have to be a result that actually occurs per the, the cases that we cited in there, um, particularly, uh, this is a State v. Flores. Um, additionally, I, I just would like to note for the record, Your Honor, you did allow them the opportunity to question Logan about his state of mind. The state failed to do so at the point in time when they had that opportunity. Well, I limited that pretty significantly. I told them to watch out um, if they wanted to get into his state of mind or, or what the result was, that it needed to be pretty narrowly tailored, and I think that that affected the presentation. If we had come, if there had been a discussion that it was an element that the state had to prove, I would open the door wide open to let them back up everything Mr. McQuarrie felt or what he thought at various times. And again, from a 403 perspective, that would have been a, a problem. I agree. I think the opportunity to even just allow him to say, I was in fear, which is what you had ruled or this court had ruled was a, an acceptable result or an acceptable question for him to just state that would have been sufficient to establish some sort of jurisdiction here. That never came out. Um, you know, it, our position is the state knew these charges. They knew the requirements for jurisdiction when they charged these two and a half years ago. They had all that time to prepare at that point in time. They didn't make the argument that they needed to do this for jurisdiction, um, un unfortunately, but that would be why I would say that was you know, they had the opportunity, they failed to meet that burden, and therefore there's no jurisdiction, Judge. 
And in fact, the evidence that did come in was to the contrary. I mean, we can sit and speculate about what Logan McQuarrie's state of mind was based on what we know outside of the evidence that was actually presented in court. But the only evidence presented was the recording and the transcript, at which point Logan states over and over again, I'm, I don't believe you. And his tone of voice on the recording, nothing indicates any sort of fear or apprehension at that point in time. Well, I think it's hard for him at that point to get his mind around what was just said. Um, I, I don't think I can conclude that he was not placed in fear or fearful at that point. But I don't think I have to get there. Um, I don't think I have to make that determination um, based on the, the language of 13108A1. Um, so that's where I'm going to go, is I think that the um, there was a result of the conduct that occurred in the state, and it was aimed at a result in the state. And I think that's sufficient under 13108A1. Okay, so I'm denying the um, motion to dismiss count one of the indictment. Now let's talk about um, the... Rule 20 motion um, re-kidnapping. That motion makes, I think, two separate argument arguments. First, that the facts do not am amount to um, substantial evidence of Ms. Johnson's intent um, to place Mr. McQuarrie in fear of imminent physical injury, focusing on the word imminent. Um, and second, even if... Um, the court finds that there was um, fear of imminent physical injury or there was an intent to place Mr. McQuarrie in fear of reasonable, um, of imminent physical injury. Um, the law requires an intent for kidnapping while restraining Gabriel, and there was no evidence that the intent occurred while there was restraint of Gabriel. So we start with the first argument. Um, and focusing on the word imminent uh, going forward. So let me let the state respond to that. So it's at page four of the motion. Ms. Ramuno. Your Honor, with regard to the first argument that um, there was no substantial evidence that she placed Logan McQuarrie in fear of imminent physical injury to Gabriel, the jury instructions do define imminent as defined as near at hand pending on the point. I'm sorry, Ms. Ramuno. Do I'm define. sorry. You just told me that I didn't <laughs> speak slowly. Um, Define them as something close at hand, something to happen on the point of happening. I believe that the dates of the crime as charged span from December 18th to the 30th, so we are not limited to just the date of the 27th. On the date of the 18th, uh, Elizabeth Johnson tells Logan McQuarrie you're never going to see him again. She leaves the state. He doesn't hear from her from day, for days. He doesn't hear from her until he calls her on the 26th, at which point they have a conversation. On the 27th, then, she texts him these, she texts him, I killed him. He calls her. They have a conversation where she describes what she allegedly has done to Gabriel Johnson. While it is true what she's describing is described in the past tense, that nonetheless does not negate the fear that Logan McQuarrie had at that time of what could be happening to Gabriel Johnson. He did not know. It's clear he did not know what was going on. He kept telling her, you didn't do that, you would never do that, you won't hurt him. He did not believe that it had already happened, as she said. He believed that it was going to happen or she was going to do something with that child to retaliate against him. The evidence shows that he then went to the police at that point. The Tempe Police Department took the allegations very seriously. They were uncertain as to what had occurred. The FBI gets involved. The uh, state of Texas gets involved. The state of Florida gets involved. Everyone that gets involved along the way is uncertain as to what has happened to this baby. Just because she said it had happened in the past, that does not negate that it that does not mean it had actually happened. Everyone was in concern of what could be happening to that child. In addition, she states she gave the baby away, contradicting her statements at one point. She, on MySpace, states she said that to Logan McCurry because I wanted him to hurt like he hurt me. Um, she tells him in the text, you're going to spend the rest of your pathetic life worrying about, wondering about what happened to him. So she herself is contradicting herself about what had occurred. And 
that does not take it out of the realm of imminent as defined by the statute. And, and I agree with that. Uh, that's the conclusion I came to before I heard from the state. I think the jury can reasonably interpret that. They may not, but they could reasonably interpret her statements on the 27th to be simply part of a continuing process of trying to um, place Mr. McQuarrie in fear. They don't have to take her, or he didn't have to take her at her word. In fact, we've made it very clear that the jury is not to take her at her word with respect to that statement or really any other to speculate what happened to um, to Gabriel Johnson. She, they're not required, the jury nor Mr. McQuarrie, to say, okay, you did it then, so that's in the past, and I am I feel terrible about what you just did. It's a reasonable interpretation for someone to take that statement and say, what happened? Is something going to happen to Gabriel Johnson? And I think that that gets by the imminent uh, physical injury, putting aside the issue of the 18th forward up to the 27th. I don't think that we're stuck with a, a snapshot on the 27th, and that's the only time that he was placed in any kind of imminent fear. I think the removal from the state plus the statements that were made before probably get them there in and of itself. But even if that doesn't, I think we don't, the jury doesn't have to take her at her word, and Mr. McQuarrie isn't held to take her at her word that the baby had been killed. So I, I don't think that there's a problem with the imminent requirement. Mr. Victor. Judge, I agree with your analysis so far up to the point where you say, I don't think there's a problem. You are absolutely right. When you say, and this has come up at one point in this trial, when you say that her statement, I killed him, doesn't mean that either Logan McQuarrie has to react any particular way to that, or that the police have to react any particular way to that. In fact, uh, I would argue a reasonable police officer, upon hearing that statement, I killed him, should not conclude necessarily that the baby's already dead, because that would that would give us a requirement that they have to believe the person. All that's true, I agree with all of that. None of that has anything to do with our Rule 20. And Judge, this again is the issue that we've been harping about from the very beginning. The Rule 20, the elements of this case, don't focus on what some other person may or may not believe about what Elizabeth Johnson said. Nothing to do with it. The elements are solely about what's going on in Elizabeth Johnson's head. Indeed, if Elizabeth Johnson had put this down in a letter, I am going to kill Gabriel Johnson. I'm planning to kill him next week. And then she sends it in the mail, mails it to Logan McQuarrie, and he never gets it, never hears about it. The Postal Service just loses it. It never goes anywhere. But that, that fact of the letter in the mailing comes into evidence. That's sufficient to convict her. I only bring that up as an illustration, Judge, to say the analysis past that is not relevant to the Rule 20. It's not relevant to the mens rea. The mens rea is about what happened in her head. So that's what we have to look at. What's going on in her head when she said, I killed him? She's not trying to convey to Logan McQuarrie that, by the way, Logan, I might kill him. But except the problem is, that's a reasonable interpretation. We don't know. I'm not in her head. Nobody's in her head. The jury's trying to determine what's in her head. But to me, it's a reasonable interpretation. I killed him to say, you're going to wonder what I just did, and am I going to hurt him? Did I hurt him? I think the whole range is wide open. If you're going to say that, then it is a reasonable interpretation to say nothing happened, something in between, or she killed him. And so I think that it opens the door to potentially any interpretation based on the totality of the evidence of what was going on. The judge, you may as well just delete the instruction not to speculate because that's exactly what you're doing. When you say that her very clear mens rea to him, I killed him, whether he inter how he interprets that is open for interpretation, that's true. But when you say her very clear mens rea, I killed him, that is substantial evidence of her mens rea to put him in fear of an imminent, in the future, physical injury? That's shocking, Judge. No, it's not. It's, it's not if the jury believes that it's part of a pattern or an intent to place him in fear, that it's one step and a one step potentially beyond. Ju but I don't think so. And, and, and your position, I think, is inconsistent with me telling the jury 
than not to worry about it or not to consider it because you're saying at that point her intent is to communicate a past injury and we're not telling the jury that or telling them to conclude that. Judge, her intent is all that's relevant. His intent is irrelevant. I, I agree. So to say that his intent is irrelevant, Logan McQuarrie's intent is irrelevant is not a problem. To say her intent is all that matters, so look at what the evidence is. Don't speculate. Do not speculate. So when she very clearly says, I killed him, that could mean she was intending to say, I was, I'm planning to kill him in the future. It doesn't make sense, Judge. It's English. And, and you're, you're allowing a contorted version of the English language. And, and, but, but, but she... I disagree because she turned around and said something completely different a few days later. It's in a, in a charged situation like this, in a charged situation with emotion, it is not, it is a reasonable conclusion to say people say things they didn't actually mean. So Judge, they should, the jury, what you're saying is we have substantial evidence that Elizabeth Johnson intended to put Logan McQuarrie in reasonable apprehension of an imminent physical injury because the jury can speculate that when she said, I killed him, because she was upset, she could have really intended to say, I'm planning to kill him in the future. Do you want me to instruct them that they need to take her at her word? I mean, the, the alternative doesn't make sense either. No. I think, and, and I don't mean to be flip about it, but I think that they can conclude reasonably that she was not... She, actually communicating that she had killed him and didn't want him to take it that way. In fact, as we've talked about, there's some indication that he at least initially he didn't take it that way. And it's meant to communicate to him, gee, what's going to happen next? What did happen? What's going to happen next? I think that that's a fair interpretation. And Judge, it might be fair if we had, as you suggest, a long course of conduct, if we had a history of these types of statements. But that's not what we have, Judge. Like I pointed out in my motion, we have, I would call, an endless barrage of overwhelming evidence that was submitted by the state on the 15th and the 16th directly to the contrary. That amounts to, I would never hurt him, I love him, I'm taking care of him. That's what we get going forward from the 15th, the 16th. We get to the 18th, as they point out, there's a statement, you're never going to see him again. But if you leave that hanging out there in a vacuum, I guess you could, spec you could speculate into that a physical injury, which is no part of that statement. You could speculate into that all kinds of things if you wanted. But with the evidence, what you have is they're talking about a custody dispute. With the evidence, what you have is after that statement, she calls the court to find out, hey, is it a real order? Do I really need to comply? Do I really need to come to court? You could say the same thing about the call on the 26th. There's another statement in there that you could say. You're never going to see him again. Sure, you could cut it off there, but then it goes forward. Because I'm allowed to move, I'm allowed to get a job. There's no injury threatened in that at all, at any point, anywhere, anytime. So, Judge, where's the course of conduct? I mean, you're, 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 specu you're actually not even speculating. We're inventing a course of conduct about a physical injury. There's not one threat of physical injury in this case anywhere up until the 27th. And to just bring in for a moment the the uh, other argument, which is separate but in a way related, on the 27th she doesn't even have Gabriel. So it's too late. We shouldn't even be talking about the 27th. Uh, there, yeah. That's the second argument. But I think standing alone, even granting you that there's no evidence, and I don't necessarily agree with that, but there's no evidence of an intent to harm or communicated that she's going to harm the child. Mm -hmm. That statement in and of itself, I think, um, can can get them there. I do think you can interpret it more than, okay, there's a past harm. I think it is reasonable to say, has the baby been harmed? Might the baby be harmed or not? Is it substantial evidence, Judge? I think so. I think that combined with taking, taking the baby and now the baby's been gone nine days, um, I, I think it is. So, Judge, what you're saying is, in the midst of a custody dispute, a statement that you're never going to see him again is substantial evidence of a person who utters it, their intent to cause an imminent physical injury. No, it's not in the midst of a custody dispute. The custody was already established and obligations were established. So in direct violation of an obligation, a court order, multiple court orders at, some, at one point in the sequence, then the baby is not returned. 
number one, so we're specifically violating a court order, and number two, there's a statement then made about the baby being killed. I think that gets them there in terms of the intent. Do they know for sure? Are, is the jury forced to speculate or try and determine intent? Is that speculation? I would argue that that happens in a lot of cases where they have to determine intent, and we don't know for sure, and they're trying to glean it. Do they have enough evidence to glean it in this case? I think they do. And Judge, I think it's not accurate to say that it's not in the middle of a custody dispute just because the court's ruled. I know that uh, as a legal matter, when the court rules that ends the dispute, that doesn't, that's not what happens in the real world, Judge. They were still in the midst of a custody dispute. They're even talking about it as late as the, of the, of the, uh, as late as the 26th. She's still making statements about a custody dispute. She's still making statements about being allowed to move. So they're in the middle of a custody dispute, and there's no way out of that. And I don't know how you, you insert substantial evidence of a physical injury when the only statement in the entire case comes on the 27th. It's not substantial evidence of an actual physical injury. It's, that's not the, the, the standard. Judge, do you want me to respond to the comment about the physical injury? You can if you want. Uh, Judge, it is about it's a physical injury. Pla placing in reasonable apprehension, the intent to place in reasonable apprehension, not that there was a physical injury. It's but reasonable apprehension of an imminent physical injury. I agree with the reasonable apprehension portion, Judge, but it's not reasonable fear of anything. It's not reasonable fear of psychological injury. It's not reasonable fear that you're not going to see your kid again as a result of a custody dispute. She's going to move and take him. It's none of those things. It's reasonable fear of an imminent physical injury. The only statement anywhere in this case about any kind of physical injury anywhere from any source at any time is the 27th, and it's a past injury. And so to say that we have substantial evidence, not just evidence, I'm saying to you we have no evidence of a threat of physical injury. But they've got to show at this point that there has been presented substantial in, uh, evidence of a physical injury, and it's not even just any physical injury. But it's, it's not substantial evidence of a physical injury. Of, of a fear, to put him in fear of a the physical intent injury. to place him in apprehension. That's different. The, is there an intent to place him in apprehension? If we look at it through that prism, saying that I killed him, wouldn't it be a natural reaction to, did you kill him? If you're going to say that, what are you going to do to him? That's, that, that is, to me, reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury. I think that, that that gets it there in and of itself. And that is substantial evidence. So then you, it's just like deleting, it's like deleting the word imminent just judge right out of the statute. Because no, I don't think so. I think imminent could be, she's saying that. Is she going to do something right now? I, I, again, you're, you're trying to write in a requirement for imminent that there be some sort of statement, I'm going to do it right now. Judge, I think it's the difference between focusing on her mens rea, which is all we know about is from what she said and what she did, versus focusing on how Logan McQuarrie or the police or someone else may have taken it. And I think that's the error here. Well, and, I'm, I, and I don't mean to communicate that my, um, my an analysis is based on uh, looking at Logan McQuarrie's response. It's, is she, does she have the intent to place him? But Judge, and, why wouldn't she have said, instead of, I killed him, if her intent really was to put him in fear of an imminent physical injury, why wouldn't she have said, I'm going to kill him, I'm going to hurt him? She didn't say that. If she didn't kill him, why would she say she did? I mean, that, that happens all the time in the in the world where you say something, but w the jury doesn't have to take her at at her word. The jury can, I think, glean an intent to communicate to Mr. McQuarrie her intent, a reasonable to place him in a reasonable apprehension that she intended to do that. Well, Judge, I think that she said why she did it later on. She said she did it to hurt him. No problem. That doesn't rise to the elements of the statute. She, in essence, the way I would characterize it, if you, if you add in her later statements about why did she say it, she's intending to put him in grief about a past injury. That's not fear of an imminent physical injury. They're completely different concepts. There is no evidence. There's certainly not substantial evidence, especially if we look, as you've suggested, the pattern, the conduct, the timeline. There's not even one threat of a physical injury anywhere in this case up until the 27th. Doesn't you're not going to see him alive again suggest a potential physical injury? It could suggest something else, like I'm just not going to return. But doesn't that also, potentially coupled with other statements, get it there as well? Judge, I think if you read it in the context of the rest of the case, 
it's right in the midst of a custody dispute. I mean, her statement on the 26th is you're never going to see him again because I'm allowed to move. I'm allowed to get a job. It's right in the middle of the custody. If you look at the 15th and 16th, immediately preceding the, the 18th, the statement that the state's relying on for substantial evidence of a physical injury, that provides, I would suggest, overwhelming evidence that that statement is not about a physical injury, that that statement is about a custody dispute, that statement made by a mom who's made lots of statements about I would never hurt him, statements of her mental state to the contrary. So how that could possibly add up to substantial evidence of her intent to commit and to put him in fear of an imminent physical injury, I think there's a shocking lack of evidence in this case on that point, Judge. I disagree with you. Anything else from the state's perspective on that? Your Honor, my, my only statement would be that uh, obviously those are arguments that he can make, but it doesn't get it doesn't uh, quash the case here. There's a pattern between these two individuals, her making statements that are untrue. Uh, we have the 404B evidence where she's claiming he's been kidnapped. She makes untrue statements all along uh, that has been presented to this jury, and I think it is reasonable for them to take all of that into consideration in considering what her intent was um, during the time charged. I agree with the state's position. So just to talk about the concurrency issue, if that's where that's the, the next is that gets us into the next issue. Judge, that gives us a, a window of opportunity here, because as we know, um, whatever the mental, whatever the evidence is for the mens rea here, and, and we disagree about that, but whatever it is, assuming that even if we change the statement from I killed him to I'm going to kill him, she has to be restraining him at the time that there's evidence of the mens rea. That starts on the 20th of December at 8 a.m. and not a moment before because that's the time at which she's that's when she's in violation of the order. Before that moment, she can take him wherever she wants. There's no restraint. There's no argument for restraint. To the time of the last time we have evidence in this case that she has Gabriel, which is the 26th, before the entire mess we were just discussing. And so you can't use that. It's too late at that point. So... What do we have during that timeline? We don't have the 18th statement because the statement she made on the 18th, she's not restraining him at the time of the intent. There's really nothing else, Judge, other than the statement on the 26th. And the only thing in the statement on the 26th, and we've got the transcript and so does the jury, it's in evidence, there's a lots of, this is the one-sided discussion, so we don't have what Logan McQuarrie said, which frankly doesn't matter other than how it might relate to statements that Elizabeth Johnson makes because it goes to her mens rea. She's talking about on page one at line 33, she's urging him to pay child support. She's saying on, on uh, page one, line 38, she did the best she could for him. She's saying in the next statement, she's doing more for him than Logan would ever do. And finally at the end, and I'm just gonna read it, it's the last few sentences, you don't care about Gabriel one bit. You've had my phone number the whole damn time and you haven't called him once. And he's going to see that. I'm sure that he is the judge in that case. So good luck, Logan. But you will never see him again, comma, because I'm allowed to move. I'm allowed to get a job. I'm allowed to have my own life and you can't stop me. So good luck and goodbye. That's the only evidence in this case of her state of mind that could be used at a time when she's actually restraining Gabriel Johnson. So that's the statement we should be analyzing. A judge, under, under any analysis, it's very difficult or close to impossible for me to understand without wild speculation how that particular statement could be substantial evidence about her mens rea to put Logan McQuarrie in fear of an imminent physical injury to Gabriel. It's not substantial evidence, judge, and it shouldn't go to the jury on the kidnapping charge. Okay. You know, under State versus Latham, this is 223 Arizona 70, um, 2000, a 2009 case. To satisfy the plain meaning of the kidnapping statute's restraint requirement, the defendant must either move the victim from place to place or confine the victim. And within the instructions themselves, it clearly states restraint means to restrict a person's movements by either moving such person from place to place or by confining such person. She moved him from the state of Arizona to the state of Texas without Logan McQuarrie's consent. I think the inquiry ends there. Well, how about, though, for the statements on the 27th, 
where the defense is arguing that the only evidence is that she no longer had him. So, so when she made the statements, I killed him, she wasn't restraining anymore, and that, in the defense's view, cannot then support the kidnapping charge because she's not restraining at that point because the evidence is she doesn't have him. Well, she was restraining him because she was keeping him from his father. No matter what method she did that under, whether she killed him or whether she gave him away to another couple, that was without the father's consent, that was a restraint within the meaning of the statute. That's the question I had and that I wrote down, and I haven't seen a case telling me one way or the other. Let's assume that she doesn't have the child and we'll go to the, she's at the tornado bus company. She doesn't have him. Um, is she still restraining if she's the person that knows where he is and has either killed him or given him away? Then she'd still be restraining today, Judge. It just, that's not what's contemplated by the kidnapping statute. Well, and I think that's the state's position. They, they've got to take that position. There's not any natural breaking point. And is that the law? Is the restraint end um, when the person's not in your presence? If I, let's say that, let's say I kidnap you and then drop you off to my co-conspirators down the street and then I'm done um, in terms of contact with you. I'm not there. A am I, aren't I still restraining you if I put you in that position where you, you're not free to go? You are, Judge, and that's a completely different circumstance. Okay, well, let's move closer to our facts. I, I agree it's different. Okay. All right. Just to make clear why it's different is because we have accomplice liability in criminal cases. Under your scenario, we've got somebody who's working as an accomplice. They're accomplishing the same goals towards the same ends with the same uh, information in mind. They're just... One is responsible for the conduct of another. That's not what we have here. Okay. Well, let's get to our either right on our scenario or closer. Now it's a, a, a child, so the child doesn't know one way or the other. Um, but I give the baby to someone through, let's say through a middleman or some other way. Aren't I still restraining that baby if the baby's gone and somebody else has the child? And the child doesn't know better. Judge, the answer turns on whether or not the person who has the baby is acting as an accomplice. If that person is an accomplice to the crime, then the crime is a continuing crime. If, if Let's just imagine for a moment, and I think, by the way, there's evidence to the contrary of this, but imagine she actually did kill the baby. There's no kidnapping at that point, Judge. She's, there's no argument that the baby is being restrained at that point. Period. You can't still have a, a kidnapping of a person you can't have a kidnapping of a dead person. But is, is the, the, merely the act of not returning the child to the custodial parent in some way, shape, or form, isn't that a continuing restraint? That's what the state's saying. And Judge, that's not what the statute says. The statute doesn't say f just simply failing to return. That's the reason right there why we have custodial interference. Well, many times statutes don't completely define all the potential factual scenarios. We've seen it in this case, and we see it a lot. So the fact that it's not written into the statute that way doesn't, doesn't answer the question for me, because frequently the case law will, will interpret the statute and the, the breadth of the statute. The question here, and I don't think there's a case or somebody would have cited it to me, talking about continued restraint that is under, for purposes of the statute, continuing after someone gives up physical possession and the states well, may be saying that Honor, they I do. I find cases that I haven't been able to analyze extremely thoroughly, but the, the reading, the quick reading that I have done of it, in this case it's State versus Viramontes, and that is 163 Arizona 334, and it's a 1990 case. In this case, they discuss the issue of restraint where a father abandoned his child in a cardboard box in a parking lot and that was considered restraint within the meaning of the kidnapping statute. Okay, well I obviously need to look at that case. To me, that's the, the critical question here. Does restraint continue after giving up possession of the child one way or the other? Can I have a moment, Judge? Sure. Judge, um, we came across Veramontes a long time ago, um, and I have a vague recollection of it, and Ms. Clark was just refreshing my recollection. First off, Veramontes analyzed a different section of the kidnapping section, and I, and I would urge you 
um, to take this under advisement and read Veramontes and make I'm it. I'm not going to make a decision this morning. I want to read okay. that case and perhaps right. other. So, so I'll say this about Veramontes. In Veramontes, um, that actually goes exactly our way to the point that we're making here. Veramontes, they analyzed the restraint, which ended at the time, I, I guess he put a baby in a cardboard box. And the reason that was a different section was because he had committed a felony. He had restraint with the intent to commit a new felony, which in that case was child abandonment. Once the child was released, that was over. The restraint was done, but the, the crime was also completed at that point. That's what Veramontes was about. It didn't go further and say it's a continuing restraint. They analyzed it from that point back in time because the restraint had ended at that point. So I would say that the Veramontes case is a clear argument that Restraint, maybe for the proposition I would state succinctly this way, you can't restrain a person who's dead, if that's what happened, and you can't restrain a person who's in someone else's care unless they're an accomplice of the crime that you are committing. Either one of those two things is not restraint, and Veramontes is going to bear that out. They don't have restraint here, Judge. And keeping in mind, we're not dealing with a theoretical possibility here. This is a Rule 20. We're dealing with the question of whether or not the state has presented substantial evidence of this to go to the jury. And also, I would, I would point out and throw into the analysis, even if there is a possible theoretical construction of the law, it's something that cuts the way of the defendant because, as the court knows, in a criminal case, the rule of lenity applies. You don't start interpreting vague, uh, somewhat ambiguous notions in a criminal statute against the defendant, especially when there's no case law on point. It goes towards the defendant. And so based on that, Judge, they didn't present evidence of restraint during a time where they've got some evidence of the, re the required mens rea, is the way I'll say it. And so I'd ask the court to review Vermontes and take it under advisement maybe till this afternoon. Because, Judge, again, and just to speak to the, the, time, the timeliness of the entire situation, it is true, and it's my mistake, that I didn't email Ms. Raimuno on it. It was, a, it was a very hectic week for us, and I had thought, based on previous conduct, where we, throughout the pendency of this case, have been emailing Ms. Andrews on Saturdays, on Sundays, nights, and it was long before Monday morning. Um, Judge, normally what happens on, and I know the court knows this, on a Rule 20, the state rests, I stand up, I make a Rule 20 argument, the state responds right there, the court rules, and if the court rules against the defense, the case then proceeds right then and there. There's not even a weekend. And so um, I wish it had gone to Ms. Raymuno. I feel bad it didn't, but the state had an entire weekend to deal with, and Ms. Andrews says herself that she knew about the filing, which we emailed directly to her Friday. So she had it Friday end of the day, so she had Saturday, Sunday to deal with this. I recognize the typical context of Rule 20. I also recognize that it's very rare that we get into issues like this in the context of a Rule 20. Almost always it goes to the weight of the evidence and rarely to a legal argument like this. Um, and I will always take the time I need to, number one, educate myself, and number two, give the parties a chance to reasonably respond, and that's what we're doing here. I don't want to get into a... I sent it to Miss Andrews, and she's been responsive before. I knew she was in Florida. Um, you knew she was in Florida, and you knew that Miss Ramuno was here as well. So I, that, that being said, I don't really care about that. I care about getting it right and giving the parties an opportunity to, to effectively argue. Um, I may be in a position to figure it out this afternoon. I may not. Um, it may have to wait till tomorrow morning before I issue a ruling because I want to read the case and then read whatever else I feel like I need to, to read, uh, especially because I have one side in writing, the other side orally, and that's it. Uh, so we'll see. I may... I'd rather you take the time to get it right, Judge, than rush, rush through it. So I agree with that. So I'm going to take it under advisement as to the second prong of the argument, and again, it's the restraint um, issue. And I'll issue a ruling either this afternoon or I may ask for more argument tomorrow. I'll read the case. I'll read other cases that may discuss the Viramontes case and do my own research to um, come to a conclusion. Your Honor, if you may, you would also to take into consideration in talking about restraint is we have two different stories from Elizabeth Johnson here is what she did to Gabriel Johnson. One is that she killed him and the other is that she gave him to a strange couple that she met at a park. 
the, if she had given him to the strange couple she met in a the park, then those facts are the same facts that you gave as an example to Mr. Victor when you said, what if you kidnapped somebody and gave them to your co-conspirators? If she gave Gabriel Johnson to a couple in the park, she's now given him to, to people who have become co-conspirators to taking this child and interfering with Logan's custody. If she killed him, then she physically restrained him. And well, so either way, the restraint element is met under her two statements. Well, as to the, the second, they're saying, okay, if she killed him, it had already happened. She wasn't restraining him anymore at the time she made the call on the 27th. That's the, the fine argument they're making. They're, the argument that you made as to giving them to another person, um, the defense argument is only if they're aware that the baby should not be given to them or some of the circumstances that this baby is being kidnapped. If it's an unknowing couple, which was one version, um, then uh, then Mr. Victor argued it's the, the restraint ends because these people don't know and they're not co-conspirators. I do note there was another version of Tammy Smith setting it up with people who then could be found to be co-conspirators and were knowing going forward. So that's a possibility under something that she said at some point and that the jury has heard. Judge, it's true that there is a, what I'll call a subversion of the I gave, I gave Gabriel to the couple that we met in the park, which was arranged for by Tammy Smith. But even, even under that version, we don't have evidence, and we certainly don't have substantial evidence, that even under that construction of the fact that that couple would have had the requisite knowledge to be an accomplice. Even, I could imagine facts, none because none are presented, that Tammy Smith says, hey, uh, there's, a, there's a girl and she wants to give the baby up for adoption. There's no dad or the dad signed off or who knows what was said. And, and so they could be completely innocent of any wrongdoing up to and including a violation of the custody order. It, it really doesn't change the analysis whether it was arranged by Tammy Smith or not arranged by Tammy Smith. All right, Ms. Ramuno, last word on... This with, one? with regard to the knowledge of the other couple, if that version of events were to be true, I don't believe that whether they're co-conspirators or accomplices has any relevance as to whether she violated the kidnapping statute. Whether those people knew or not is irrelevant as to whether she restrained him uh, by moving him from place to place or confining him without Logan McQuarrie's permission. It doesn't matter whether they knew or not. It, it rests on she did not have Logan McCoury's permission to move that child from place to place or confine him in any way. Okay. All right, let me take a look at it, and, and I'll rule. All right, so we're not accomplishing everything we wanted to this morning. We still have um, two issues. One, the jury instructions, and second, the... Um, Dangerous Crime Against Children Rule 20 motion. Let me briefly raise that, and then we're going to come back to it when we come back, presumably around 1.30. I had, I think, um, given a preliminary indication that I was going to deny the, the motion for the reasons that we talked about the other day. Um, I've got, as I thought about it, I've got some significant concerns about whether... Um, whether the state has produced substantial evidence to show that the defendant really did target a victim under the age of 15 as required by the case law. I'm really struggling with it, I'll tell you that. And I want, Ms. Andrews, you to know that I'm going to come back to it because we need to talk about it again as I've looked at the cases, looked at the definition. I'm really troubled by whether there's a, under the cases um, interpreting um, the statute, whether there really was sufficient targeting here based on the state's theory of this case. So we'll need to talk about it. And then specifically that the state said Gabriel's a pawn. He's a pawn and, and said in really no uncertain terms that she was targeting Logan McQuarrie. Now maybe you can argue she's targeting Gabriel too with that. But I'm troubled by that. And I know we talked about the hypothetical about holding a gun to a baby's head. We're in a gray area and I'm really troubled by it, number one. Number two, if we get there, to me, it's got to be in the aggravation phase, and actually the Rule 20 is premature right now because the recent, there's the recent Arizona case. Um, I, I didn't bring it with me. can't remember the name. From a month or two ago that basically said you can't, things like a dangerousness allegation, that needs to be in the aggravation phase, not in the guilt phase. To me, this fits. It's a sentencing enhancement. It needs to be in an aggravation phase, 
which means the state hasn't yet really presented its evidence yet of aggravation and needs to do that, and then I rule on it. So I'm not going to rule on it until then, I think. But I wanted to give you the heads up that I'm really struggling with the substance of that argument. Did that make sense? It, it makes sense, Judge. Whether we agree with it is a different matter. Well, do you disagree that it should be in the aggravation phase if I let it go? Judge, let me first say, confess, I haven't read the case, so I don't know. I would say that to the extent we have a choice, I would probably consent to leave it in this phase. And then third, um, normally I bring, not at Rule 20 stage in any event, I bring early on just a motion to strike the dangerous crime against children allegation before we even hit the trial, and we chose not to do that in this case. So if the court wants to take that and treat that, simply as a motion to strike the dangerous crime against children allegation. I think that's perfectly fine. In essence, it's the same. So we don't want a ruling reserved on that point. We would like a ruling. In fact, Judge, if you want, I could refile it today as just a motion to strike the dangerous crime against children allegation. And, and the only, I think, barrier to me then deciding the issue would be if the state says we want to present additional evidence in and we want the opportunity to do it in the aggravation phase, and we haven't produced it all because it's an aggravation issue. I think that is the law right now, that it's an aggravation issue and needs to be in the aggravation phase. So think about that over lunch, because we'll, we're going to talk about that at 1.30. We'll, we'll also talk about the jury instructions at 1.30. Okay, anything else before we break for lunch? Not from the state. No, Judge. All right, I'll see everybody at 1.30. Okay, we're back on the record in Ms. Johnson's case. Ms. Johnson's here. The jury obviously is not here. Um, we're back to talk about, I think, um, mainly jury instructions. I also raised the issue of how we uh, resolve or how we present uh, the allegation of dangerous crimes against children and told the attorneys I'm still struggling with the substance of defendant's argument there regarding whether... Um, Gabriel Johnson was the target or was targeted sufficiently to create a potential dangerous crime against a child. I think it's a very close question, frankly. In looking at the cases, there are no cases directly on point, obviously. We have to deal with the language of um, mainly, I think it's the Williams um, case uh, about targeting and there are cases that we can analogize to that cut both ways, in my view, and it's a very tough call. And I'm uh, still um, wrestling with it. And I'm not sure if there's anything else we can do, because the state didn't file a written response. The state argued um, last, was it la the week before last. Right, because you only got the written <coughs> motion in, in time. Did you read the Sapahi case as well? The Sapahi 2? It's a Supreme Court case. Did we talk about it on? Did we cite it in our brief? Just a note for the case law for the court to review. You know, I may, I think I may have read it, but it's not, uh, I can't tell you for sure because it didn't make its way into my notes. The Williams case, the Garola case. And the Carlisle case did, but the Sapai case did not. Earlier, the Sapai case is pretty important because it actually clarifies their ruling in the Williams case. It's probably the most important case on dangerous crimes against children okay. and targeting a child. Hang on for a second. Let me see if I can... I'd love to be able to read the case right now, but I don't have my Westlaw sign-in information here. I've got it upstairs where I automatically kick in to the uh, system. There's a couple other sites, cases that I pulled up while we were at lunch so I can provide okay. to the board. Why don't you give them to me? I know you don't have time, but I don't know. To explain, 
Sapai case uh, is a Supreme Court case from 2003 that specifically addressed the ruling in Williams and clarified their ruling. Um, prior to Sapahi, there's a case that involves a kidnapping. It's State versus Samano, S A M A N O, 198, Arizona. I'm trying to find the actual site for it. Here it is. 198, Arizona, 506. And that case actually is a kidnapping case where a woman is, she's being burglarized and the defendant in that case tells her to hold her child and it was a kidnapping case. In that particular case, the dangerous crime against children was not upheld. That case has been overturned by State versus Miranda Cabrera. It's M-I-R-A-N-D-A dash C-A-B. R E R A. Can you say that again, Miranda? Cabrera. Okay. That's 209, Arizona 220. And while Sapahi didn't address the Samano case, Miranda Cabrera does and essentially finds that the Samano case would be overruled by Sapahi. Okay. I have some additional factual arguments if you want them. Why don't you go ahead and make them, and then I'll read the cases and obviously issue my ruling, but go ahead. You're going to issue your ruling today, Judge? Um, I don't know if I'll issue today or tell you right up front tomorrow morning. On the DCAC? Correct. Okay. And then... You, the DCAC to... would still have to wait. I know you talked about redesignating your motion. Conceptually, I'm okay with that. But in terms of presenting it to the jury, it would not be in the guilt phase, I believe. I don't think the state disagrees with me that they have to do it in the aggravation phase. Your Honor, we're not conceding that. I've read the Patterson case, um, which appears in that case the state did concede, and it appears the holding is the dangerous allegation had to be done in an aggravation phase. The answer is I don't know. As I'm sitting here today, I. Other than the Patterson case, I don't know the law, if it would apply differently to dangerous crimes against children. I did contact our appellate bureau to ask them what position they wanted me to take, and they don't have an answer right now for you. Um, if you decide that it's in the aggravation phase, I don't think it hurts the state any and as I far as this particular case goes. My interpretation of Patterson, it basically says any sentencing enhancement under, I think it's Rule 19.1, needs to be in the aggravation phase unless there's an exception made. If it's already an element that's proven um, in the guilt phase, then you don't need to go back and do it again in the aggravation phase. And that's why in Patterson they said no harm, no foul. And I can see that if it's the dangerousness by the use of a weapon, sometimes it's that, that issue is tried in the guilt phase. Here we don't have anything of the sort being tried in the guilt phase. So my thought is it's got to be. I don't disagree on that. That's what Patterson says. And if this were a case where under the age of 15 was an element, perhaps like a child molest case, that might be a different issue. I, I just don't know if, if there's anything else out there that I'm not aware of that would say differently. But I agree that that's what Patterson says. Judge, I think the case and the rule um, both come down and say, conclude that if we said, yes, Judge, we want it in the aggravating aggravation phase, it would have to go there. But I think that. Uh, Rule 19, I think, makes clear that we don't have to do it that way unless we're in, unless we're wanting to do it that way. I, I realize there may be circumstances and there may be cases where it's prejudicial to the defense to do it that way for lots of reasons. I don't see this case as one of those cases. I think that um, the defense has no problem if indeed you don't strike the DCAC tomorrow. Um, we'd just rather do it in the guilt phase. Okay, and I think you're right. It's your argument to make, and if you say you don't, you're okay with it being in the guilt phase. I think it's not error to put it in the guilt phase. And so, Judge, I'm just trying to make things easier for the court. Um, of course, if you just strike the kidnapping, we don't even reach the question. But 
I just did that for your benefit, Judge. But, but in any event, I think that maybe the way it ought to go tomorrow, it sounds like, and this is what I was a little unclear about, that you are going to rule tomorrow morning first thing, which is 1030, I guess, on both the kidnapping, well, actually, if you rule on the kidnapping first, and you rule 20 the kidnapping, there's no need to rule on the DCAC. So if you rule on the kidnapping and you deny our rule 20, then you would rule on the DCAC. And if you deny what was initially filed as a rule 20, and we can redesignate as a motion to strike if you like, then our position would be that the DCAC would go in the guilt phase to the jury. Okay. And what my hope is, depending on what time we finish today, I may be able to get an email out late today telling you what I'm doing, just so you get it, and then I can put on the record the reasons why um, tomorrow, uh, if that's possible, my ruling one way or the other. But I may not get to it this afternoon. I don't know. Judge, um, I'm fine with that. The only thing I would ask for is a time where we could agree on that no earlier than this time you would make your ruling. And the reason for that, Judge, is uh, Ms. Clark and I feel that the Veramontes case is not something uh, that changes our position on the concurrency issue. And so I've asked her uh, to go back and quickly draft up a supplement to our Rule 20, which if you give me a time, I will email that both to Ms. Andrews and Ms. Raimundo and uh, to the court, so the court can consider that for the court's ruling. I just don't want to have that after the, if the court rules today on that. Of course, the state hasn't even filed a written response yet, and they're getting the supplement back, too, but that's... Judge, the only reason for that is because they brought up Vermontes, and I wanted to make sure I got an argument to you on that. Here's what we'll do. Let me see if we can figure out a time based on what time we finish, since I'm not sure what time we're going to finish. Uh, okay, so back to the facts you wanted to raise with respect to the DCAC. Your Honor, so the, the holding in Sapahi says that the defendant's criminal conduct was focused on or was aimed at the victim, and that the dangerous crime against children statute did not require a finding that the defendant was particularly or pecu peculiarly dangerous to children. And I don't believe that second part, the fact that the defendant is dangerous to children, is an issue for this court in this particular case, right? Your concern is the targeting and focusing. Um, but, Your Honor, what's important to understand is the conduct has to be focused on a victim. It's not that the end result has to be focused on a victim. In this particular case, we essentially have two mens reas. We have the mens rea that the defendant has to have knowingly restrained Gabriel Johnson. If the jury doesn't find that the defendant knowingly restrained Gabriel Johnson, they're done. There is no kidnapping charge. That's all that they need to find before they get on to the next step, but they have to find that. So they have to find specifically that the defendant's conduct was to knowingly restrain Gabriel Johnson. So there's absolutely no possible way the defendant could have committed kidnapping in this case unless she targeted her conduct at Gabriel Johnson. Now, the rest of the statute is to place Logan McQueary in, in, fear, in apprehension, re reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury. Now, the statute for kidnapping says that you knowingly restrain one person with the intent to place a third party in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury. Technically, in this case, we didn't even have to name Logan McQueary in the indictment because her actions are against Gabriel Johnson. Now we've discussed back and forth, she doesn't even have to, have to place Logan McQueary in reasonable apprehension. It's been argued by the defense repeatedly that she only has to have the intent to place Logan McQueary in reasonable apprehension. It doesn't have to happen to Logan, but she does have to restrain Gabriel Johnson or there's no kidnapping charge. So there is absolutely no possible way for her to commit kidnapping unless her conduct is targeted or directed at a child. And I think where we get in into the issue is the whole concept that she was trying to get back at Logan. Yes, that's why she committed the offense. That's her motive. That's the reason behind it. But that's not her conduct. Her conduct is restraining Gabriel Johnson. And so there's absolutely no possible way that they can find her guilty of kidnapping. If, if they don't find her guilty of kidnapping, they don't even have to consider the dangerous crime against children statute. There's no possible way for her to have committed the offense without directing her conduct at, at Gabriel. 
And then they have to determine, based on the evidence we presented, that he was under the age of 15. Okay. Uh, Mr. Victor, anything to add from your perspective? Briefly, Judge, I, I think that what Ms. Andrews said exactly gets to the heart of the issue. To accept her argument, Judge, which is what she said, if you find that my client intentionally restrained Gabriel Johnson, every single kidnapping case, when you got a victim under 15, it's automatically a DCAC. And that's not what our statute says. That's not what it's about. That's not what the intent is. Merely because she intended to restrain Gabriel Johnson is insufficient to find the why. That's the issue with the DCAC, Judge. It's not that she intentionally restrained Gabriel Johnson. It's why did she do that? I could imagine a case when somebody does that for the purpose of targeting the minor. You could have facts like that. I'm not saying you can't have a kidnapping with a theory like this that could be targeting to the mind. But that's not what we have here. She, she did intentionally restrain Gabriel Johnson. Why did she do that? To target, aim at, direct at, just like she said. That was the motive. She gave it away. That's what the case is about. That's why they came out in opening statements and said, he's a pawn. Because although she intentionally restrained Gabriel, just like Miss Andrews said, it was for one reason, one reason only. It wasn't to get at Gabriel. It was to get at Logan McQuarrie. That's what the case is about. That's what they've argued. That's what this particular theory is about. That's what all of the evidence suggests, including the evidence they presented that I even talked about today in the MySpace conversation. Everything came up in 15 and 16 and all the way through the case, even to the 26th, last time she had him, was all about not her trying to cause harm to Gabriel or targeting him or focusing it on Gabriel. It was about Logan. She even admitted the evidence they presented why did you send that text message to Logan McQuarrie? Because I was mad at him. I was trying to get at him. That, the whole case is about that. So, Judge, I think that uh, her argument, in essence, subsumes the DC, the entire DCAC, which we know, Judge, just from a reading of the Williams case and the Sapai case, that helps us. They, they even say in the case, and I hope you do read it, Judge, that there was no question about who was targeting. He held the gun to the minor and shot the minor. There's no question in that case about who was being targeted knowing that this was a minor, someone under 15. That was clearly a DCAC case. This case is something completely different. Like I said, Judge, we started somewhere where it was the legislature saying, we're going to go after people who prey on Arizona's children. I admit, just like when I brought it up the first time, we've moved from that. But we haven't moved far enough where we've gotten to the point where the state presents a case and says, this kid who was the pawn is now the target of a dangerous crime against children. Judge, that stretches the DCAC concept so far beyond anything that our legislature intended and so far beyond anything that the Arizona Supreme Court in Williams or even any of these cases say. So I'd ask you to strike that tomorrow morning. Doesn't the um, Garola case cut against you in that the defendant there, I think, hit his girlfriend in the head, knew she was pregnant, but was not targeting and didn't hit her in the stomach, hit her in the head. And the evidence was was trying to kill her. But because there was, as I think the court described, a conscious disregard for the risk to the fetus, that was enough to target. It's just like the other case, Judge, where, and I forget the name of it, it may have been the Cabrera case, which was the one with the kids in the desert. And where they, the person was helping smuggle across, left the family in the desert, one of whom he knew was a minor, was reckless about the injury. In both of those cases, there was an injury that you, you, could, you could reduce that and say, when somebody intends an injury or recklessly causes an injury to that minor, recklessly, conscious disregard of a substantial risk, you have to be aware of the situation, consciously disregard it, there's an injury. Here, Judge, we're so far removed from that because, like I said the other day, we don't even have any evidence of an injury whatsoever. No, en no evidence of an injury. And to the contrary, we don't just have an absence of evidence here. To the contrary, we have a lot of evidence that she was taking care of Gabriel right down to the pictures that were submitted where their case agent on the stand every single day right up to the 26th, healthy, happy, nothing out of the ordinary. That's why this is a... This is easily distinguishable from those cases. It's radically different conduct than that. It's all about getting at Logan. Gabriel was used, no doubt. He was 
He was a means, and I'll agree with the state. He was a pawn to make it happen, but it's just not enough for a DCAC. Okay. Ms. Andrews, anything else on that issue before Your we move on to jury instructions? I'm sorry, I do. Um, because defense counsel brought up again Miranda Cabrera, on page 40, they actually give a pretty good example. Um, what they say is the court explained by way of example, and they're sorry, citing... Are you talking about the Miranda Cabrera case? I am, and they're citing Williams. You said page 40, but wasn't that 209 Arizona 220? Okay, page 225. Okay. It says, the Williams court explained by way of example that if a person harassed a school bus and thereby recklessly injured a child passenger, he or she would have sufficient focus to satisfy the requirements of the Dangerous Crimes Against Children statute. Alternatively, if a person was driving recklessly, endangering the general public, and just happened to crash into a school bus, resulting in an injured child, his or her focus would not satisfy the statute's requirement. In this case, Gabriel's not a happenstance victim. He's not there. The defendant's not out endangering Logan McQueary or committing a crime against Logan McQueary, and Gabriel happens to be a member of the general public who becomes a victim. He's actually the person that she commits an act to. Here's what makes our case complicated, though. He's not a victim. He's not the named victim. In that case, you hurt. He is, Your Honor. He's not the named. They both are. It's the, the, the indictment reads, the defendant knowingly restrained Gabriel Johnson with the intent to place Logan McQueary in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury to Gabriel Johnson. That's what the indictment reads. And in fact, we can take out Logan McQueary's name and still go forward on trial. We could not take out Gabriel Johnson's name and go forward because you have to name the person who's being restrained. We could have said the defendant knowingly restrained Gabriel Johnson with the intent to place a third person in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury to Gabriel Johnson. And that third person could have been anybody. But in this particular case, it was Logan. They are both named in the indictment. They are both victims in this case. And the target of her actions, her conduct, was against Gabriel Johnson that then resulted in her intent to commit an offense against Logan McQueary. Okay. All right, let's talk jury instructions. You should have, I think, did we give them drafts? You should have drafts. Now, I took out and would potentially have to put back in the instruction regarding dangerous crime, defining a dangerous crime against children. Um, I had not yet, with this draft, I think I actually did put in one of the instructions requested by Mr. Victor on Friday. He requested... Um, See. Yes, there was. He proposed essentially four different instructions with variations of the four types. Um, clearly, a, a definition of imminence appropriate. Um, I want an affirmative definition, not a negative. It's not this. Um, and so I chose 8B, although the I didn't look at Black's Law Dictionary, the sixth edition. Is that a verbatim? I'd prefer to go verbatim out of the dictionary. I didn't check. I do know, and I've got a fifth edition, which is older than, the obviously, the sixth, and it's different than what I had in the fifth edition, not markedly so, but there is a difference. Um, what I'd like to do is give the Black's Law definition. No, Judge, I, uh, I can't say with certainty either way, but, but I do recall vaguely that when I was looking at it, there may have been some words in there that were, as often is the case with blacks, that were sort of old English or just not really sort of pertaining to the case or something. We may have taken out a couple of words, um, but I, I, guess, I guess I could bring that in. or, or I, I, Just reading the proposed instruction looks fine to me. I mean, I, mean, it, I think it. I mean, Judge, can I make a little bit of a pitch for 8A as well? In a minute. Okay. Let me just check and see if the state's got any issue with 8B, because it is, I think, in this draft. I put it in on page. Um, put it in page eight on page eight in the middle. 
and I took it verbatim out of 8B. Governor, if it's verbatim from the Black's Law Dictionary, we would not object to it. Okay, well, I'm hearing it may not be. <laughs> so That's what I'm saying. It may here, not be. I, the, think, oh, I think if it isn't, it's probably 97% for close. The onus is going to be on you by the end of the day to say, we don't like it, for, and it, it should change for the, for the following reasons or change as follows. I don't see anything in imminent defined as it reads now on page eight that's going to cause an issue from my perspective. Okay, let's let's take these in, in order. Though. Well, we'll talk about 8A. Um, let me tell you, my bias is I don't like instructions, and I'm always hesitant to give an instruction instead of saying this is a definition or this, these are the elements of the crime, to instruct on what's not is, to me, problematic at a, at a couple different levels because a lot of things are not. And it, it starts moving to me instructing the jury that they need to listen to one side's argument or the other's talking about what's not part of the definition. And so I am always hesitant to give up what's not definition. And that's obviously what 8A is, saying imminent is not an event which occurred in the past. You can tell the jury that and argue it. I'm not inclined to instruct them on what's not imminent. I understand, Judge. Two things about that. First, I know there are other instructions in here that talk about what's not. Um, probably even in the Portillo instruction, you know, proof beyond a reasonable doubt is not uh, proof that you know, it gets past every doubt or those types of things. We have those concepts, and there's probably five or six more that I could find in there. Um, so that's one notion. Just because it's sort of a negative type of an instruction doesn't mean it's a bad instruction. But the second thing I would put more in an affirmative way, which is this is our defense theory. And so it's not that I'm just asking you for a negative instruction for the fun of it. This goes right to what our theory of the case is. And I think that the statement itself isn't something that we could dispute. You, you know, they may, they're free to argue that you know, there are other things in addition to that, but, and it doesn't even say the particular statement in question. I mean, if I, I would like, like that, but I tried to draft them in a way that were fair to both sides. It just says an event which occurred in the past is not imminent. I think that's true, and I don't think anybody can argue that, and I think that helps explain the word imminent, which frankly, Judge, I know it's a word that we use a lot, but it's not that common of a word, and sometimes people are confused about, I, I don't know if I'd call it a 50 cent word, but it's not a two cent word either, it's about a, maybe a 25 or 30 center, and I think it's a fair request to say, unless there's some dispute, and I don't think there will be, that an event which occurred in the past is not imminent, I think that's a fair statement. Ms. Andrews? Well, Your Honor, I know of no legal authority that allows the defense to get a jury instruction because it's the theory of their case. Um, certainly, they could argue that to the jury, but the reason that we don't object to the Black's Law definition of what imminent is is because there's a legal basis for it. There's no legal basis for their instruction. It's just the words they want written in because that's what they want to argue to the jury. They can argue whatever they want to the jury. It doesn't mean the court has to instruct the jury. If all the parties got whatever instructions they wanted based on the theory of the case, then we would have pages and pages and pages of instructions that have no basis in the law. And that's what this instruction is. It has absolutely no basis in the law. Judge, that just isn't true. There's lots of authority. So from the Arizona Supreme Court, I cited it right in my supplemental request for a jury instruction, State versus LeGrand, with a string cite, 1987, as well as State versus Rodriguez, 1998. And it says, a party is entitled to an instruction on any theory reasonably supported by the evidence. We're entitled to a theory, as long as it's an accurate statement and there's some support in it, we're entitled to a theory on the defense case. And this is very clearly, as the court well knows, very central to what our defense is in this case. And it's not a misstatement, and it's not something that Ms. Andrews is getting up and saying this isn't accurate for some reason or there's some other problem with it. It's a real simple statement, Judge, and I think it's central to the defense case, at least on kidnapping. And so I would um, very much request that 8 8 be given even in conjunction with 8B. Yeah, I, I'm not going to give it because I think it's in it crosses over to um, essentially accentuating someone's argument in an instruction what I think 
in a way that I think would be inappropriate. Is it over the top? No. Is it true? Yes. Um, I think you can argue it, and I don't think the jury is going to be confused. If you get up and say it is a fact that an event which occurred in the past is not imminent, she can't get up and argue with you. She can't. And, and I think that being the case, I'm not going to go down the road with saying what something or what a word does not mean in this circumstance. I recognize your argument that sometimes we have to do that. So I'm going to give 8B and not 8A. Just a suggestion. I numbered these so we could talk about them and it would be clear on the record. Could, could we just go back through our requested instructions, starting with number one? Some of them you gave, but, like, for example, number two, I wanted to talk a little bit about. Okay. Well... Okay, we'll make our record now then. Hang on, let me pull the previous filing. Okay, we're looking at um, I'm, hang on. We can print one out for you, I think. Let me make sure I've got the right document. Okay, it's going to be, can, can we get on ISIS in this case? I don't, because I think, I, I want to work with this copy, so we need to get you one. October 3rd, yep, and it's defendants requested final jury instructions. If you could print that real quick. We're going to print a copy for you. Okay. Um, Mr. Victor's requested that we talk about his proposed special jury instructions in order. On um, October 3rd, he submitted uh, four proposed instructions, and then on October 12th, he submitted um, variations of instructions 5, 6, 7, and 8. We've already talked about number 8. We're going to talk about number 1. Um, Judge, number 1, I think you had already given even uh, before I requested it, so 1's not an issue. Um, special jury instruction number t two, there's actually a typo there, um, which I wanted to make sure that it's corrected. It deals with the uh, DCAC. It says, if you find the defendant is guilty of kidnapping, but that the defendant's conduct was focused, it should say, was not focused. Just reading. Okay. And number two? Yeah, number two. Are you sure? It makes more sense than I Oh, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. It is correct. It's got a little bit of a correct. You're right. It says wrong. So, I guess... So, take not out, obviously. Take not out. Okay. In so other words, it was correct the first time before I opened my big mouth. Um, number two obviously only applies if you find that the DCAC stays and we keep it in the guilt phase. Um, I think it's sort of self-explanatory. We'd like to have that one in there because I think that that's what the theory is of the state's case. It's, it's a little bit of a variation on the defense theory issue. It's the theory that the state made, and so we want, obviously, for them to find that uh, if they believe the argument that the state made, which was in essence that Gabriel, Gabriel was a pawn and Logan was the target, then it's not a DCAC. It's not just the inverse of the DCAC statute. Here's the problem I have with that. Um, a crime can be targeted both to, to more than one person, I think. That's the problem with that. They could find that it's aimed at or um, that it was not, I'm sorry, that it was aimed at or targeted um, against Logan McQuarrie, but that doesn't answer the question of whether they're finding that it was targeted or Gabriel Johnson was targeted. That's the ultimate determination. One's not exclusive of the other, in other words. Well, Judge, what if we put the word solely after was and before focused. So it would read, if you find the defendant is guilty of kidnapping, but that the defendant's conduct was solely focused on, directed against 
Amen. Incidentally, Judge, let's try to avoid, because I know we always wind up with this sort of somewhat horse trading on these jury instructions. That's why that was the theory behind some of these other ones with an A and a B and A, B, and C. It was sort of intended to be A as my sort of first choice, B is another construction, C is another construction. I understand. Okay, um, okay Ms. Andrews, so inserting the word solely after was and before focused, or maybe after focused, I disagree with the instruction altogether. Uh, in our jury instructions that we submitted, I believe I submitted a special verdict form for dangerous crime against children. That's the law, and that's what the jury needs to decide to determine if the dangerous crime against children statute applies. It talks about this determining that the crime was focused on Gabriel Johnson, and if they find it, then they can find a dangerous crime against children. And we believe that that's all that's, that should be supplied. If the defense is trying to get a different instruction that doesn't need to be in there. I mean, the question is whether or not the offense was, was a dangerous crime against children because it was targeted and directed at a child, not whether or not it was targeted and directed at someone else. And like the court said, you can have more than one victim, and I think we're trying to confuse the issue when the special verdict form... I'm looking for the special verdict form for the... You're calling it a verdict form, but it's really the instruction. Uh, it's page 20, your, your, that's the last page of your proposed instruction. Isn't that an instruction versus a verdict form? And I thought I submitted it as a, as a verdict form. It says verdict form, statutory criminal, but then it just basically is an, an instruction. Right, but it would, be, it would be something they would only find if they found the crime. So it would be something they would consider after deciding that the defendant is guilty of the crime. So it would be a special verdict form. Okay, so it makes up part of what would be a special verdict form. Right. So, are you, are you looking at her? I am looking at the 6.04.01 dangerous crime against children standard instruction. Judge, part of the problem I'm having here is um, I mean, I haven't seen anything, and I'm not aware of anything that sort of is authority for this concept that the criminal conduct can be targeted against A and B. I mean, the DCAC statute doesn't read that way. We've sort of just sort of written that in, which is, well, it could be targeted against both Gabriel and Logan, and that, that would be sufficient. But that's almost common. To me, that's almost common sense. You can target multiple people, and sometimes for different reasons. I, I guess I don't, I don't need it to be set forth in the statute to, to tell me that that's appropriate. I'd but for purposes of DCAC, it's got to be targeted at a minor, at someone under 15. And, and I don't know if the law is that if, it, if they're sort of an incidental target and someone else is, we're sort of making a major target and a minor target, I guess is the way to put it. Um, it's not clear to me that that is exactly, you know, that's why we talk about, it, it's not just targeted either, it's, um, you know, focused on, directed against, aimed at, targeted, it's all these, that sort of makes me, to me, it, it rings as if that's the primary, that's the main person, that is the reason for the criminal conduct. Well, it, and to me, probably the most effective way to present this somewhat difficult concept to the jury is the language that the state submitted where the jury must find that the defendant's conduct was focused on, directed against, aimed at, or targeted a victim under the age of 15. To me, that's probably the most effective way of communicating it to them. And I don't think it's appropriate to say if you find that, that Logan McQuarrie was targeted, therefore it's not, or now even going down the road to say, well, if he was solely targeted, I As I'm thinking about it, Judge, I'm starting to agree with you on that point. So I think I've never been able to convince you of anything else. This <laughs> is the first time, Judge. But you haven't ruled yet, so maybe tomorrow we'll agree with something. I don't know. But, Judge, maybe what we ought to do then is just so the record is clear that the defense will just stand on the request for special jury instru instruction number two as written, and then the court can make a decision about that. Okay. 
I am going to, um, I'm not going to give special jury instruction to as written because I think the state's proposal on page 20 of its proposed instructions as to a verdict form and the statutory definition of a dangerous crime against children, um, which did previously appear basically in that form on a, um, in a uh, previous version of the jury instructions as dangerous crime against a child, defined verbatim as the state has done it on page 20. I'm going to give that. Okay, Judge. And the verdict form will look like that. And then number three, special jury instruction number three, I think you've essentially given. Yes. That brings me to four. Four is one that I don't, I don't know that we've ever really resolved. And um, I, I do recall at one point the court saying, I asked Ms. Clark about it. She thought the court had said that you were sort of inclined to give this. There's really two parts to this one, Judge. The first part is Logan McQuarrie's state of mind is not an element of any charge in this case. If we stopped right there, I think that's a fair statement that nobody could argue with. And then it goes on to say, you are not to consider Logan McQuarrie's state of mind for any purpose. If you wanted to add to that any purpose other than jurisdiction or something and let them think about if his state of mind applies to the jurisdiction issue, then I guess we wouldn't have a problem with that. But I'm still concerned, as I have been from day one, that the jury is going to confuse something that we've had a, spent a lot of time talking about, Judge, which is what effect, if any, does Logan McQuarrie's state of mind have on the kidnapping charge? And another way to maybe make it a little clearer, judges, if you want to change it to Logan McQuarrie's state of mind is not an element of, of the kidnapping charge or something, or you know, if you want to try to tie it a little closer into the kidnapping, or how about you were not to consider Logan McQuarrie's state of mind for the kidnapping charge. Maybe that... Are we to consider it for the other two counts? I would really prefer it as written, Judge. And so, I mean, I don't want to talk you out of that if, if you like it. Well, I, I, I am much more with you on this one because... While I've expressed the um, uh, reluctance to give a negative instruction, where I think there might be confusion and the jury needs help with something negative, I'm much more inclined to give it. And here, I agree with you that it could the jury could easily slip into a talking about Logan's state of mind. Was he really afraid? If they focus on that, it's wrong. It needs to be focusing in, on the defendant's state of mind. So. I, especially the first sentence, I think it's, I'm probably inclined to give it. Let me see what the state says. And we would have no objection to the first sentence. We object to the second sentence. I can discuss that further if you need me to. Go ahead. Um, first of all, there are several reasons why we don't think it's correct. As the court had stated previously, um, what... Elizabeth thinks that Logan's state of mind might have been goes to her intent. She had to believe that he would have reacted in a certain way for us to prove she intended to place him in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury. So we've discussed that, and that's why the court gave us very little leeway the court gave us on getting that information out. We also were allowed to get it out to explain what Logan did next. And so it is relevant to a purpose in this case. It's just the defense is trying to argue it's not relevant to whether or not Elizabeth Johnson committed kidnapping, which we agree with. And so it's not relevant to an element. But to say it's not relevant for any purpose, I think, is incorrect. Judge, I would be happy with, with sort of qualifying it a little bit and saying you are not to consider Logan McQuarrie's state of mind for any purpose relating to the kidnapping charge. But then they think but we can consider it as to the other two charges. I know that's... I don't want that, okay. because they're not supposed to. I'm inviting them to then do that for the first two charges. I don't want to invite them to... I mean, Judge, the, the truth is, it really doesn't have any relevance to this case. And I never thought it did, and I still don't think it does. And I think the potential for confusion in problems here is great. Judge, you, you, you brought this sort of limited purpose up, which, in fact, I forget exactly how you said it, but it was something along the lines of, if she did something, got a result, 
and then did the same thing again, expecting to get the same result, it might be, it might be important. I agree with you on that point. That's sort of the pattern argument. But we don't have that here. We don't have a situation like that here. This was the first time that this ever happened between Elizabeth Johnson and Logan McQuarrie where she took him and left the state and made these types of statements and things like that. Well, took him and left the state June to, to the Boston. Boston trip? That's one time, taking him and leaving. So I, I do think but, there's... But, Judge, it has to connect to some kind of putting him in fear of an imminent physical injury. There's absolutely not a scrap of testimony that just because she took him to Boston that he was in fear of a physical injury. He didn't say anything like that. There's no evidence about that. There's no testimony about that. Are you intending on arguing or saying, and Logan McQuarrie was X, his state of mind, he was fearful. He was, because if you're going to accentuate it, I'm worried about it. I don't get the, the, the sense that you're even going to really go there, because he didn't say much about it. Just like the evidence came out, is, is what happened and what he did, and what happened and what he did. Well, and, and, and the, the reason I guess I ask is while I've said that his state of mind might be relevant in terms of coming in, right now it's not the way the evidence came in, his state of mind is really not relevant to the jury's analysis right now. That is, he's not going to argue, oh, he wasn't even worried about it at all, I don't think. Um, well, Your Honor, they're trying to argue that, I mean, they specifically have already stated that they're going to argue that that she didn't intend for him to have reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury because she said she had already killed the child. So by arguing that, they're bringing it into an issue. I mean, how can we address the fact that He's in reasonable, that her intent was to place him in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury, even though she said she had already killed him. Sentence one, to me, is non-controversial. -con uh, I'm going to give the first sentence. The second sentence, I'm just worried about where we're going to go based on the argument that I'm not sure how it's going to come out. So I'm comfortable giving the first sentence a special instruction four. So with the jury instructions, that's now going to go into find the place I want to put it. <coughs> Judge, can I make a comment as to the second statement still or no? You're not going to get me to put it back in. If you feel like you need to make a record, go ahead. Well, Judge, I'm trying to understand. Uh, the second sentence is, you are not to consider Logan McQuarrie's state of mind for any purpose. So that sort of begs the question, if for what purpose, given the evidence that came in, given the elements of the crime, for what purpose could the jury consider Logan McQuarrie's state of mind at this point? That's what I'm struggling with. Doesn't that sentence help if, if <coughs> Mr. Victor tries to make an argument that Mr. McQuarrie wasn't even concerned about it. Doesn't that sentence help you? His state of mind doesn't actually matter. No, because I think we shouldn't be able to respond to it, first of all. And second of all, the, the issue is, is the defendant had to intend to place Logan McQuarrie in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury. How is reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury not a state of mind? How can we have the charge and not talk about how it affects his state of mind? Not necessarily in that he said it affected his state of mind this way, but we're going to talk about what she did, the causes that would <coughs> be intent to place him in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury. I mean, reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury is a state of mind. Okay. We have to talk around it, I think, to talk about whether there was the intent. Shouldn't I add Logan, the word actual after Logan McQuarrie's, Logan McQuarrie's actual state of mind is not an element of any charge? I'm not sure. I mean, what other state of mind would we be talking about other than his actual state of mind? I mean, to me, it doesn't add anything here. 
She's talking about his anticipated state of mind based on her action. Judge, these are issues we deal with all the time in criminal. They come up all the time. But Logan, I think the example that I gave Judge when we were talking about the Rule 20, which is if she had written it in an envelope, put it in a mailbox, and it never went anywhere, she could be convicted, Judge, even if Logan McQuarrie never even heard it, because it's all about what's going on in her head. It doesn't matter if it even reached Logan's head. It's just not relevant. Okay, I'm giving the first sentence as you wrote it. I'm putting it on page 7 after acts and statements of co-conspirators. It's going there. So, Judge, does that mean that the state could get up in closing argument and say, I want you to consider his state of mind for some purpose that I can't even envision? If they say that, you say, objection, move to strike, and I say, sustained. <clears throat> To me, that's the way to handle it. I'll be listening for it. Judge, does it change anything if I bring up Logan McQuarrie didn't even believe? I mean, I could bring that up. That's the evidence they presented. That's the state of mind. That's the state of mind. It is the state of mind. But in this case... And, and then that will, in her rebuttal, she'll say, here's the instruction. She won't say that <coughs> Mr. Victor wanted. Logan McQuarrie's state of mind is not an element of any charge in this case. And then she probably would want me to say you're not to consider Logan McCurry's state of mind for any purpose, but we're taking that out. That's my, that was my point, that it makes sense to have that put in because I could say that in closing argument. But you won't now that we talked about it, of course. Am I prohibited from saying that? I mean, I want to be clear on this, Judge. She presented that evidence. She, she put evidence to the jury of Logan McQuarrie specifically saying he didn't believe her repeatedly. They have that in their hands, the transcript. I'm not sure I'd prohibit you from saying it. I'm not sure I'd sustain an objection. Not sure you'd sustain an objection? Not sure. I'd, I'm not sure I would. Do you want that second sentence if he's going to drop that in there? No. Okay. Because we disagree. We think the state of mind is relevant for purposes. The defense wants to say it's not relevant, and then they want to argue that it is. And, and we that, think it's relevant. We have always thought it was relevant. We always thought it was admissible. So no, I don't want that statement. Either. And Judge, that's my Exhibit A for why the jury is going to be confused on that. Because with, with all due respect to counsel, the state of mind of Logan McQuarrie is really not relevant, and yet she's still making an argument that it is. And so I'm worried and concerned, and I'm, I'm frankly happy and thankful that at least we're getting the first sentence here. Because I think that the jury could easily, in the midst of a case where a baby's missing, and Logan got on the stand, he seems like a nice guy, was very upset, they could be swept away by those kinds of things. Okay, you're going to get the first sentence and that's it. Yeah, it sounds to me like they're looking more of, for an instruction that says, you know, please don't be swayed by sympathy for how Logan McCreary may have been felt or something, something well, like that. Not whether we have an instruction that says Okay, so it's the first sentence in number four, going on page seven after act and statements of co-conspirators. Okay, let's get to number five. Judge, number five is, uh, again, right to the theory that we were talking about, which I would call the concurrency um, argument. It deals, it, it deals with that these two things need to happen at the same time, the restraint with the state of mind. And that, that's the defense theory of the case. We have cited cases that say the defense is entitled to an instruction that tracks with the defense theory of the case. It's an accurate statement of the law. It uh, clearly is a viable theory based on the evidence that the state presented and failed to present. So I don't couldn't understand why we wouldn't get number five. Because it's just another way of stating the elements that are already out there for kidnapping. It doesn't actually talk about that they need to happen at the same time. It's certainly implied by saying restraining with intent to, but it doesn't actually say that they have to happen at the same time. Sanders. Your Honor, actually, may I respond to this? You may. 
Um, I, I don't believe that it is an accurate statement of the law. I don't believe that the cases they cited in their brief stand for what they state. Um, I don't. The, in fact, the memorandum opinion that they cited in a footnote specifically goes through the fact that there are no cases that specifically talk about the timing of the restraint and the, the intent. So I don't believe that is an accurate statement of the law to begin with. So then, Judge, I, I would have expected an argument from the other side on the Rule 20 that, hey, um, she can have the intent at a different time than she is actually restraining. But we didn't hear that argument. The reason we didn't hear that argument is because that's not what the statute says, and it's not what the statute means. The statute says that she needs to restrain with the intent to. We also cited a case that she doesn't have to have the intent at the moment the restraint starts. I agree with that. But they have to come in at the same time. And again, the fact that the state even makes this argument is evidence that the jury may be confused about it. It's very central to the defense case in our uh, closing, and I, I think it is an accurate statement of the law. It, it, goes, it comes under, Judge, what you said earlier, the sort of common sense clause. It says restraint with intent to. They have to happen at the same time. I think the case that you cited, which is the district court case involving, I think, abducting a child and taking him to Las Vegas, it does say that as the intent does not have to start at the same time as the restraint. But clearly the intent and the restraint have to cross at some point in time. Um, I'm not sure I want to further define the kidnapping instruction, maybe to clarify that the intent and the restraint have to, at some point, be co-occurring. I'm fine, Judge, if you can grab If we put it that way, Ms. Ramuno, do you agree that at some point the intent and the restraint have to be co-occurring? They have to, don't they? At some point. At some point, Your Honor, however, I don't believe that there needs to be a special jury instruction to point that out. I think that the, the statutory jury instruction, or the one that's already contained in the, in the proposed jury instructions, is sufficient. He's going to stand up and say, she wasn't restraining him anymore at a certain point. Clearly, that's what he's going to do. If he's going to do that, he wants to be able to then say, if she wasn't restraining him anymore, then... We don't care about the intent at that time. And he's going to go to the 27th of December and going to say, doesn't matter what her intent was, she wasn't restraining him anymore. So he wants the instruction so he can say, no matter what her intent was on the 27th, if you find that she wasn't restraining him at that point, she's not guilty of kidnapping. That, that's the argument he can make. I mean, that's a viable argument under the, the statutory instruction. Why does he need a special instruction to drive that point home? The, the reason he would, in, uh, I don't want to make that argument, but I do think that it may not be apparent to the jury, because we're spending time on it right now to try and figure it out, that at some point the intent and the restraint must be co-occurring. Judge, all, all I did was I, beefed, I, I said that, and I just beefed it up by putting the intent in there, which is if you read it, that's what it says. And, Judge, the reason we need a special instruction is because probably most kidnapping charges with this theory don't have this issue. This is an issue that probably doesn't come up very often. It's an issue in this case. It's our theory of the defense. It's an accurate statement of the law. And I think that the court knows, if for no other reason, that the court took it under advisement. It's a serious issue in this case. I'm inclined to try and craft something. I don't, I don't like your instruction. I just don't like it. But I do like the concept of in, um, intent and restraint need to happen at the same time. 
I don't know how we get there in a short and simple way. Judge, maybe we can start by saying, what is it about the instruction that you don't like? I mean, I won't take it personal. It's just a jury instruction. I mean, the first part regarding the kidnapping charge, I just wanted to sort of hone them in that this only applies to the kidnapping charge. Well, it would be it would immediately follow kidnapping. We've already got the definition of kidnapping. What I'm looking for is a sentence, if we can make it, that says that the required restraint and intent must occur at the same time. You could say that, Judge. Is that an accurate statement of the law? I don't know what it is, Your Honor. I, I think maybe you could say something more to the effect that she had to form the intent to place Logan in a reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury at some point while also restraining Gabriel Johnson, that be more accurate. I think that's the same what you just said, Judge. I mean, to it, say, it, it, like, it is, but it may be a little bit more. I, I want to give as much clarity as I can. I can't like use a word like co-occurring or something. It's going to give him a headache. Okay. Judge, no, really? I mean, the, the question is, it seems like they have to cross, but she could have restrained him and then form the intent, or she could form the intent and then restrain him. Correct. Yep. And so they they don't have to happen simultaneously. Correct. And so at the same time is the concern I have. Well, they don't have to begin simultaneously, but they do have to occur at the same time at some point. Well, I think saying occur at the same time could be misconstrued as they have to happen at the same time when the intent and the restraint could have happened at different times. Judge, that, that's our concern. And that's the why I put the time bar right, from December 18 to December 30, which is the indictment period. And I just put that in there. I mean, I tried to, what I did, Judge, why it's so long, is I called out the intent and laid out what the intent was, rather than just say the relevant intent or something like that. But it also says at the time. That's our concern, because it seems to imply they have to simultaneously happen at the same time, and we don't think that's what the law says. You have to be able to point to one point in time where you have both the intent and the restraint. They don't have to start at the same time, they don't have to end at the same time, but there has to be one point in time where both of those things are occurring. So you have to act on the intent at some point, either to restrain or continuing to, yep. continuing to restrain. coming up with something that doesn't seem to really narrow it much. The defendant must at some point in time have both restrained Gabriel Johnson and intended to place Logan McQuarrie in reasonable apprehension of Im imminent physical injury to Gabriel Johnson. The defendant, what does it say again, Judge? The defendant must at some point in time. But can I stop you there? It can't be any point in time. It has to be between December 18 and December 30 which is the indictment period. That brings up a topic. Shouldn't we have the dates in the definition of kidnapping at the very least? Probably should. The dates on the custodial interference and the conspiracy are different too than the kidnapping charge. We need right. to make sure they have the accurate dates. Okay, let's go off the record for a second while we're going through this to give our court reporter a break and while we're ruminating about what we're going to do. <clears throat> okay, give me the 
dates of the kidnapping? December 18, 2009 through December 30, 2009. Okay, so I'm, I'm adding in kidnapping page 5, the crime of kidnapping requires proof that between December 18th and December 30th, 2009, the defendant knowingly restrained Gabriel Johnson with the intent to... Okay. Now... Judge, if you look at our special number five, all we're saying is that at some time between December 18 and December, December 30, I mean, I, I really don't think, I mean, I added, you could say I maybe put too much in here because I have, regarding the kidnapping, you could take that out by putting it as part of the kidnapping. The state has the burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. I mean, you could take that out because they have a burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, all of it. And you could shorten it by taking out the intent to place Logan McQuarrie in reasonable apprehension of him and physical injury to Gabriel Johnson, and by just saying the relevant mental intent if you wanted to. I, but I may think that, in essence, we're trying to say what it is that we're actually trying to do here. It's just a little, maybe it's a little bit wordy because I'm putting some of this, calling it out rather than shortening. Exist while the defendant is restraining the victim, the elements of kidnapping are satisfied. I think that's the case we cited, Judge, in Rule 20. Oh, it is. Okay, so we're, we're, that's what we agree. So, why don't we, do we want to say that very sentence? As long as the requisite intent is found to exist while the defendant is restraining the victim, the elements of the kidnapping are satisfied? Well, no, that's too broad. Okay. Can I see that? Yes. I can craft it around it in a way that's not quite that broad. Thank you. Okay, what about this? The state must prove that the requisite intent existed while Gabriel Johnson was being restrained. Putting it after the kidnapping. So they read kidnapping, and it comes right in behind it. Judge, I'm not against that. But rather than have them sitting there scratching their head, wondering about requisite intent, doesn't it make more sense to lay out the requisite intent and just say, the state must prove, or however you started it, that Elizabeth Johnson had the intent to put Logan McQuarrie in fear of an imminent physical injury to Gabriel while at the same time restraining him. 
I mean, I think in essence, that's sort of what, that's really what I did is I just called it out so it wouldn't be confusing to them. But it's, if I say this intent, it's qualifying, it's coming right after the intent. I'm not against the judge. I just think we could pinpoint it a little bit better by you know, calling it out. I like this. Could you read it one more time, Judge, so I can Okay, so it? it's page five. After kidnapping, we're going to put another paragraph right there. After place, Logan McQuarrie in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury to Gabriel Johnson, and it will say, the state must prove that the requisite intent existed while Gabriel Johnson was being restrained. Do we have some sort of language that informs them that at some point during the restraint, it doesn't have to be when the initial restraint, or it has to be at some point during the restraint? Isn't that what it says? Well, the state must prove that the requisite intent existed while. At some point, it's probably better. State must prove that the requisite intent existed at some point while Gabriel was being restrained. Yes. Okay. I know you you want yours, but I think it's a decent compromise. Can I get you to do state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the requisite intent existed? I don't want them to think that there's some other standard on there. I think that's fair. Uh, we don't list the standard in everywhere else. I mean, we don't say the crime of kidnapping requires proof beyond a reasonable doubt. We don't say the crime of custodial interference. We do say the state has to prove each element of each offense beyond a reasonable doubt. Right, but but this is not really an element. I mean, at least we're not saying it's an element. If you want to say that... It's being basically written as an element. Some it's a burden of proof the state's got. So I, I agree with the state. Okay, let's go back on the record. Um, we've been talking off the record about um, defendant's proposed special jury instruction um, number five, and I have settled on the following paragraph to go at the bottom of page five of the jury instructions, and that is the state must prove that uh, the requisite intent existed at some point while Gabriel Johnson was being restrained, period. So that's how we're going to modify the request for number five. Okay, Judge. Moving to number six. Okay, hang on for a second. And Ms. Romano, Ms. Andrews, I'm going to put your case here so I don't keep it. Six. A, B, and C deal with the, uh, what I'll call the imminency issue. statute applies, is that a factual finding for the jury, or, and the, Ms. Andrews is saying yes. Yeah, it is the same argument the court made in regard to the Rule 20 motion. Just because she said she had already killed him doesn't mean that she didn't have the intent to place him in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury. They want instructions that say otherwise, and they're not accurate statements of the law or the facts in this case. Well, actually, Judge, I mean, it, it, 
this doesn't just pinpoint it on the statement. If you look at 6A, it says if you find the defendant's intent was. They may, they may use that statement and say, well, even though she said I was, I killed him, she really meant I'm planning to kill him or something like that. They may find something else about the intent. But if they find that the intent was to put him in fear of an injury that had previously occurred, if that's what they wind up concluding, then they do have to come back not guilty. Well, as written, it's not correct because they could find that she both meant to put him in fear of a physical injury that had previously occurred and might occur in the future. They could, but then his intent isn't just to put him in fear of a past injury, an injury that had previously occurred. Well, that's not the way 6A is written. I, I, again, you can argue those points, but I think 6A, B, and C, to me, are not uh, appropriate. You're not going to give any of them? They, they amount to argument. Yes, I'm not going to give any of them. For the reasons I talked about this morning. Because I think a defendant's statement or description of an injury that occurred in the past could be sufficient that allegedly occurred in the past. I'm asking the jury to find that they actually did occur in the past with 6C. If it, that's asking them to conclude, did the injury really occur in the past? Well, it just says that you can't use a past, if, if all you got are past statements, you can't conclude. It doesn't say past statements, it says injuries statements or descriptions of an injury that occurred in the past. So they have to decide whether it's really an injury that occurred in the past, and I've well, told them not to even talk, uh, consider whether there's been any injury. Judge, it's really, it's really just based only on those. They may find other things. This just says statements or descriptions of an injury that occurred in the past. Those by themselves, and maybe we could even put in there, the defendant's statements or descriptions of an injury that occurred in the past by themselves are insufficient to prove such defendant had an intent to place, I mean... I disagree. I, I think that, as for the reasons we talked about before, that could be sufficient. So that 6ABC line doesn't move me, so I'm not going to give 6. 7. I think 7 is the question of jurisdiction that is for the jury to decide that deals with the two sections that um, are could be applicable here. What's the state's view? Well, Your Honor, I guess that depends. In reading the case law on the case, um, it is only a jury question if there is a dispute on the law about jurisdiction. Now, we previously discussed the jurisdictional issue in regard to the motion to dismiss, um, and we presented the information with the fact that Logan was in Arizona when she made the phone call and when she had restrained Gabriel. That's not a jurisdictional um, issue as far as whether or not the jury can hear this case. That's not disputed. Whether or not Logan was in Arizona is not disputed. That is not a fact disputed. What I think might be at dispute is when Elizabeth Johnson, where she was when she formed the intent. That may be in dispute, so if it's the intent that gets us jurisdiction, that may be an issue. But if we have jurisdiction in the state of Arizona on something that's not disputed by facts, then according to the, the law and the cases the defense cites, they don't get jury instruction, it's up to the court to decide if there's jurisdiction. And that's kind of where we sit here, is I, I think there we have jurisdiction based on an issue of fact that's not in dispute. Actually, I think there are some facts in dispute, Judge. I mean, as to the first part of this, there isn't an element of the crime of kidnapping that occurs in Arizona, so that's out. That's, and that's not the basis. I found it on the basis of the adverse consequences. I, I know, so I'm getting to the second part, adverse consequences which have to be part of her design. That's the part that's in question. They need to find that because really what happened here, you could find that she had, it, and, and what the evidence is, she did have a design to hurt Logan McQuarrie. She, she said, uh, I killed him. Then there was a phone call. She filled in a whole bunch of details about that. She had a design to do certain things. This might be the part where it is interesting to bring up that he didn't um, believe what she said. He then took action and did certain things. Whether those things are sufficient to confer jurisdiction on Arizona really turns on whether or not that's part of her design. That's for them to decide. 
Judge, I, I still agree with the state that there's not a truly factual dispute regarding any adverse consequence that would have occurred here in Arizona. But it's not just about adverse consequences, Judge. It's about whether the adverse consequences were part of her design. She has to be contemplating. It's not just that it resulted in some adverse consequences. If they find that she had the intent to place Logan McCree in a reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury to Gabriel Johnson, isn't by definition that gets us to the consequence being in Arizona? Well, I think that the question the about... The intended consequence. I don't know, Judge, because she's she her it goes it's her intended consequences. She's in Texas. I mean, really, what happened here is Logan takes action, touches off an investigation in Texas and in Miami Beach and the FBI. Very little of it happens in Arizona. But the consequences, if she's if she's their theory is she's targeting Logan. There's no dispute. He's here. So the consequence happens in Arizona to Logan, who's here. It's, does she have the intent? Not, did it actually occur? But, you know, Judge, when we talk about her text message and the phone calls, in the context of whether it's sufficient for the imminency issue, you like to give a very loose standard of what, what could be believed. I mean, she yes, she said, I killed him, but maybe she really intended to make him think that I was going to kill him or I was going to hurt him or something like that. So there's sort of a very broad of what she intended. I would ask you to um, um, apply exactly the same flexible standard to what her intent, her design was by that statement when it comes to jurisdiction. It could have been anything. They could, the, I mean, I could imagine a jury <laughs> believing anything about her intent if they don't believe that the intent is solely to tell him about a past injury. You could sort of superimpose any but consequences. This, this presumes they find guilt on the kidnapping. In order to do that, they have to find that she intended to place Logan McQuarrie in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury to Gabriel Johnson. If they find that, to me there's not a dispute that Logan was in Arizona and that it meets the legal standard of it being um, essentially the consequence being here. But I don't Judge, think there's remember, a dispute. He doesn't even have to have heard it. She could have had an intent to put him in fear the, re the requisite intent without him ever having heard it. Right, but there's no dispute that he was in Arizona, that she knew he was in Arizona, um, and I, I, I agree with Ms. Andrews. It's not a fact that's reasonably in dispute here. But Judge, if we look at the flip side of it, let's imagine the intent is clear. She says, I'm going to hurt Gabriel tomorrow. She says it in a letter, puts it in the mailbox, and the postal uh, post office just drops it. It never leaves San Antonio. That's sufficient intent for kidnapping, no question about it. Logan never heard about it, was never in fear, never did anything, never took any action whatsoever. I would argue that under those facts, Arizona does not have jurisdiction. There's nothing, there were no adverse consequences in Arizona. But here's the problem, that no one then likely would have jurisdiction other than where she mailed it from, maybe? Well, no, I wouldn't say that. Who would have jurisdiction? Texas. Texas, if they choose, I don't know what the elements of Texas's crimes are, Texas could take whatever action Texas thinks appropriate under their criminal code, but when, for our analysis, Arizona doesn't have jurisdiction under those facts. And all I'm saying is something between those facts, which we're not that far away from, Judge, because Logan is saying, I didn't believe, didn't believe, don't believe, didn't do it, you didn't hurt Gabriel, and... and he did believe and took adverse consequences. That's a jury question. I think we're way far away from those facts. The statute requires the result be in Arizona. Um, there is um, undisputed fact that Logan got the message that talked to her. She that he talked to her about it. Um, and if this isn't the case where or analogous to her putting it in the mail and nobody getting it. But Judge Logan talking to her about it on the phone isn't going to be sufficient to confer jurisdiction. All I'm saying is, it, there isn't, to us, the defense position is, there's enough here to let the jury decide. If they want to argue that there were adverse consequences, here's what they were, they can make that argument. But if you don't allow some kind of a jurisdiction instruction, then the jury is then deprived of even making a finding about whether or not there's jurisdiction. I mean, if you want to modify the instruction in some way, 
that's fine, but they ought to at least get to make the finding. I think I agree with the state. Of course, the safer method would be to let the jury do it in case the appellate court disagrees with me. That's always safe. Then there's not a question. But I really don't, uh, I essentially agree with the state's argument, though. But doesn't that judge get, just get it to the jury, like on the Rule 20, so the jury can still make the decision about whether or not there's jurisdiction? I mean, we asked you to kick it out and dismiss it. You don't agree. Fine. Um, that's an issue, but to not let it go to the jury at all deprives the jury entirely of even hearing the question. And I, and I think seven is just, just a regurgitation of what the jurisdiction statute says. It's actually not. It's taking, not. Out, taking out the other sections in the cases. It's not. The ad adverse consequences is not in the statute. It, that comes from the cases that interpret that statute. So, I mean, if, I guess I'm okay with rewording. The way that's written, we would have to litigate whether there were adverse consequences to Logan McQuarrie, which I specifically said this morning I didn't agree with. It's not adverse consequences to Logan. It's just adverse consequences that just generally occurred in Arizona. What would those be if they didn't occur to Logan? What would, what adverse consequences are they? Would they argue that that arose from her intent to place him in fear of imminent harm? Judge, I could imagine an, an expensive investigation might be such a consequence that was undertaken as a result of something Elizabeth Johnson did. They still believe that we shouldn't include any form of number seven. Your Honor, I, I understand the court's concern about it possibly being an appealable issue. Reading the cases on the issue, unless they determine that they're wrong in these cases, it appears that if there are not disagreement of facts that allow for jurisdiction, it doesn't go to the jury. Um, and I think we have facts that allow for Arizona to have jurisdiction that are not in dispute. I think in addition to um, Lo the intent to place Logan in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury, Logan's in Arizona, I, number one, I don't think that's just a result. I think that's an element of the crime. We have to show she intended to place Logan in reasonable apprehension of imminent f physical injury. How is she going to do that without having some sort of communication or some sort of action against Logan? The second is, the, under the definition for restraint, we have to show that she was unlawful in what she was doing. And because what makes it unlawful is that is the court order. Question number seven. Okay. Judge, are you going to give any form of a jurisdiction instruction? I don't think so. If I'm not going to give this one, I'm not going to give any. If I was going to give one, it would be this one. I know that doesn't make you feel any better. No, well, I, it doesn't make me feel a lot better, but... Um, it would be a form of this one, not this one, but it would be a form of this one that focused on um, result slash adverse consequence. Judge, it's just the defense position that there's enough here to go to the jury to make a decision about whether or not there's jurisdiction in this case for the reasons that I've pointed out. Okay. And I disagree. Okay. Now, let's talk about lesser included. What do we decide with lesser included? Your Honor, we agree that unlawful imprisonment is a lesser included offense of kidnapping if the defense requests it. We agree that interfering with judicial proceedings is a lesser included offense of custodial interference. I think we already decided at the last time we discussed that access interference is not it has elements that don't apply. Um, we do, however, need to talk about a special verdict form for both kidnapping and unlawful imprisonment because they have to decide two things if they find her guilty of either of those crimes. One, if she took the child out of state, and two, if she released the child unharmed before the issuance of an arrest warrant. And I thought I submitted a special copy of the special verdict form and our requested jury instructions. I don't have one in front of me. to both, it, it changes the class of felony. 
on both kidnapping and unlawful imprisonment, on both whether or not she took the child out of state and whether or not she released the child unharmed prior to a, an arrest warrant. I wanted to submit that. So we've got to add unlawful um, restra uh, restraint. Imprisonment. Uh, I'm sorry, unlawful imprisonment. As a lesser included of kidnapping. Correct. Then interference with judicial proceedings as a lesser included of custodial interference. Your Honor, the defense requested the defense to custodial interference, and I, I thought the court was going to take that under advisement. We believed it didn't apply because it required the defendant to have filed for filed an emergency order of protection. I think I, I had already ruled. Just to, just to review, so I'm keeping up here. We have unlawful imprisonment as a lesser of kidnapping. Correct. And then we have interfering with judicial proceedings as a lesser included of custodial interference. That's right. So that means we're going to have at least five verdict forms now. And Judge, I have just some a point of clarification before we get too far away from the jurisdiction question. Is the court prohibiting me from raising the jurisdiction issue in front of the jury? I think I am. I can't consistently, I can't refuse to give an instruction and then let you argue it with no guidance. What I'm finding is that there are facts that are not in dispute that establish it, that as a matter of law, jurisdiction is established. Okay, just wanted to make sure that we were clear on Your Honor, you said there are five verdict forms. I, I showed four. I showed the kidnapping, the unlawful imprisonment, dangerous crimes against children, and custodial interference. We have the conspiracy to commit custodial interference. We have the three alleged in the, um, in the indictment. That's we true. have two lesser included, so that's five. And then do we have a separate then for dangerous crimes, potentially, so six? Wait. No, now I have five. If the dangerous crimes is part of the kidnapping. Dangerous crimes against children. Goes with yes. the kidnapping. That's a separate. It doesn't, I don't know if it needs to be a separate form. Can they just. It can go into the kidnapping. No, they need to find. You mean, if you find that she's guilty of kidnapping, then you must further find. Yeah, I agree for all of those. The special verdicts can go with them. What other special verdicts do we have besides the DCAC for kidnapping? On custodial interference. Oh, there's the take. No, I mean, taking from the state. On custodial interference and conspiracy to commit custodial interference, it's taking, removing from the state. Okay, and that's set forth in your proposed. And we also used that in the Tammy Smith trial of the home support. And the child was voluntarily returned without physical injury. The child was not voluntarily returned. That's what you no, submitted. No, those are. Yeah. They also, okay. Then for kidnapping and unlawful imprisonment, the court, there's also a special verdict for whether or not the person was released unharmed. Okay. And that's the one I don't think that I provided to the court. You did not. Because it's a lower class of felony if they're released before there's a Okay, so you need to provide that to me so we can put that together. But you have the one for custodial interference. Correct? I've got it for custodial interference. Okay, so it's a kidnapping and lawful imprisonment. Conspiracy to commit custodial interference. Do we need the same special it does. forms? Because we'll need to know what class of felony it is. Okay. Okay, so that's going to be challenging. Um, this is that's for the custodial. That's for the custodial interference and the interference, uh, the um, 
the conspiracy to commit custodial interference. And then you're going to submit the kidnapping the way you believe it should look and include a DCAC special verdict form as part of it, the kidnapping. You know what so I'm just saying? add the DCAC to the kidnapping? Yeah. Have. Just like we would typically add the dangerousness before. Okay. It's, uh, when I've done it, it's always been separate. It's not been attached to the defense. It's always just been something. I guess I'm okay with it being separate. I don't think it matters. It need to say if you find the defendant guilty of kidnapping. Okay, so now we're up to six verdict forms by my count, right? Yes. Okay. okay. What else do we need to talk about? Um, scheduling. All right, we can do this off the record. Um, well, let, let's put this on the record first. Let's stay on the record for a second. Um, you've informed me that Ms. Johnson does not intend to testify. Is that correct? That's correct, Judge. Okay. Ms. Johnson, I'm going to ask you because I need to just confirm it for the record. You've made the decision um, to not testify. Is that correct? Yes, Judge. Okay. And you understand your rights with respect to testifying. It's your choice if you would like to testify and you're choosing not to, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and then the defense is not going to present any other evidence, correct? That's right, Judge. Okay. So we're ready to get into closing arguments. The jury's been told to come back to 10.30 tomorrow. We will, as close to 10.30 as possible, have be ready to go with jury instructions. I would assume that we then get into the state's close. I would assume, based on timing, that we're going to go beyond 12 o'clock. My intent would be to tell the jury we could go beyond 12, get ready, we're going to then take a lunch break at whatever time the state finishes its close, and then we'll come back for the defense close and rebuttal after lunch. The only thing, Judge, I think maybe we should allow a little bit of time for is the court is going to render two very significant rulings in the morning that could radically change both closing arguments. Get your attempt tomorrow. Um, it's more than likely that you're going to get something this afternoon since we're now pushing into the afternoon. Uh, but I'll get it out when I can. If Ms. Clark is getting me something, hopefully she's getting it to me as soon as possible. you want to put a deadline on that, Judge? Just four, so we know. Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Okay, Judge. Your Honor, is it possible, I don't know, if for um, someone to tell the jury before we bring them in that we might go later into lunch? It just makes me nervous when I'm talking to them if they're starving. So we will tell them. Snacks. Kim will be back tomorrow, and so I'll talk to Kim um, about telling the jury that we're possibly going to go beyond. We'll see what time we start. I'm a little worried about based on past history, that we won't start till 11.15 or 11.30. I'll finish the instructions at 11.55. Where does that leave us? <coughs> Do you have a, a rough estimate of how long you expect to go? About an hour and a half. Yeah, I know in, in the Smith trial we went till 1. I could, if need be, I can include a break in there. Let's see what time our festivities begin tomorrow. I want you here at 10, though, and we'll, uh, we, we need to have Ms. Johnson ready for 10 o'clock so she's here. I will basically tell my morning calendar tomorrow we're operating with a short fuse. I haven't looked at my calendar tomorrow, but we'll get them in and out. Um, So that's how we'll handle it. And then you're going to try to tonight give us an email or something that says how you feel about the Rule 20 issue, the concurrency portion of that, and the DCs. That's my goal. Is there a time after which it's not going to happen? Is no, that... it could be really late. I could be here late. Okay, Judge. I don't want to f figure it out at 7 or 7.30 and be constrained from sending it out. I have both emails, so okay, Judge. I will. Yeah, that would be helpful. 
And then I'm wondering if you do make that ruling tonight, if we need to be here at 10 o'clock. Still, we should, because I want you to look at the verdict forms. Okay. Ms. Andrews, you need to send me a proposed one this afternoon so we can um, get it together. I want you to look at the jury instructions again. So 10 o'clock wouldn't hurt. Okay, Judge, I just want, want to um, let the court know I have an 8 o'clock hearing, which if everything goes just fine, I should be here in plenty of time. I'm sure it just fine. Okay. Any other questions about what we're doing? All right, so I'll see everybody here at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Judge, just in terms of another scheduling question, if she goes until, say, 1 o'clock, we come back at, I'm thinking, 2? Yeah. Like that. yeah. And then mine will probably, well, of course, will depend on your rulings. That will affect the length of it. And then they'll start deliberating tomorrow. I, that would be my assumption, yes. You have them deliberate till 5? I have them deliberate no later. Typically, if there's a possibility for aggravating circumstances, we tell them that because of just the, the way the, the court structured, we need them to come back by a certain time, like 4.15, so we could get to those. Here, I may not even worry about it. We'll tell them that, that if they're going to go beyond, they have to stop at 4.30. Because let's say they come to a verdict at 4.15 to get everybody together and announce the verdict is going to take a while. So I'll probably tell them that they need to, to stop at 4.15 or communicate to them that if they're close to a verdict, it needs to happen by X time. But Okay, and I'm assuming there's not a problem with me and Chandler while they're deliberating here, or do I need to stay downtown for the other days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? I need you within 30 minutes of getting here. Uh, my office is about 35. I need you within 35 minutes of getting here. Okay, Judge. It just it's going to take time, and I think it's reasonable for you to be there. I don't want you, of course, if I make you stay here, it'll take us 40 minutes to get everything together. We have to get Ms. Johnson, presumably. Let's say we go to the jury tomorrow, and they're, they don't come back tomorrow, and they come back sometime Wednesday. We're going to have to get Ms. Johnson get her dressed and do all that stuff's probably going to take some time. We'll, we tell the jury it always takes time after a verdict to get everybody together and that it's going to be some time, so okay, being in your me. office is not an issue. Yeah, that just helps me organize. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Okay. I will see everybody tomorrow. Okay.